My name is Peter Drake. I'm the Dean of Academic Affairs at the New York Academy of Art, and I want to welcome you all to our second Facebook Live feed. Um, tonight, for the next two and a half hours, we're going to be watching three of our most esteemed faculty members and one of our most esteemed recent fellows paint from the live model. <clears throat> they will be painting Dan Thompson and Michael Grimaldi. Michael is our uh, director of our drawing department, and uh, Dan is the faculty chair of the CFA program. We will be taking questions from our live audience during the evening, and we will also be taking questions from our Facebook audience. If you're interested in uh, questioning or making a comment about tonight's procedures, please go to the comments section on Facebook and enter the questions. We'll get to them as soon as we can. Uh, right now, I want to introduce uh, my three fel fellow uh, moderators. We've got David Kratz, who's the president of the Academy, uh, and also an alum. And we also have Margaret Boland, who's one of our most respected faculty members. She's going to be joining us in questioning our artists and our models this evening. Uh, <clears throat> of our four artists, we have Manu Saluja, who is a faculty member in the Continuing Studies Program and the CFA Program. We have Alyssa Monks, who is a fellow, uh, 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 I'm sorry, a faculty member and a graduate of the Academy. Uh, both have very, very distinct styles of painting that we're going to get to later. Um, we also have Bernardo Siciliano joining us. Bernardo is from Rome originally, but is now a faculty member uh, and will be demonstrating, I think, a sort of more open form approach to painting. And we have Sophia Caiaphas, who's a recent graduate and also a recent fellow, uh, who will be joining us this evening. So we'll get into some more details about their lives as artists and their approach to their painting as we go through the evening. But as I said, if you have any questions and you want to share them with us, please don't hesitate. Uh, for now, I'm going to hand this off to David Kratz. He's going to give you a little bit of a background to the school and our mission. Thank you, Peter. I am uh, incredibly excited to be here tonight. I just woke up today thinking this is going to be an incredible night, and uh, we hope to reach a very wide audience with the work of these incredible artists here. Um, portraiture and painting is central to everything we do at the school, and it is at the heart of the Academy's mission, um, which is really the reason we're all here and the reason that I am so excited to be here tonight. I want to start by thanking our partners. Um, at the school, it's all about community, and everything we do takes uh, calls on every member of our community. Tonight, we want to uh, thank Highline Stages for donating all the uh, equipment and lighting for the uh, event tonight. Um, Barnesville Easels, without whose support, we literally could not do this. Um, da Vinci Artist Supply for providing the artists with brushes and palettes. And um, by the way, our artists tonight are using uh, Williamsburg handmade oil paints uh, donated by Golden Artist Colors. So the Academy is a very unique place. We started in the uh, early 80s, and it was started by a group of artists and patrons who were worried that the traditional skills and techniques of fine art making were no longer being taught in schools across the country. So they set out to create an alternative and to find a venue to preserve exactly those types of traditions and skills. Um, we at the school believe that highly informed, rigorously trained, technically capable artists are in the best position to realize their creative dreams. Um, working from live models is at the base of the program. We also believe that almost anything you need to learn can be done uh, through that method. And once you learn it, we say to you, that's not enough. Now we want you to go out and do something that's unique and urgent and personal. Personal. Now we want you to go out and make vital contemporary art. That's what it's all about here. Um, we believe that you have to know the rules to break them, and then we expect you to break them. One of our early founders, uh, earliest founders and supporters, in fact, one of our uh, very first board members was Andy Warhol. And people are often surprised uh, when they hear that he was so involved with the school because they think of him immediately in terms of pop art. But he, too, was a classically trained artist and um, knew the value of, 
uh, of these kind of skills and techniques and needed those skills and techniques in order to do the kind of work that he did and became known for. Um, he also very much believed that there needed to be a place to preserve them, again, in the context of using them for vital contemporary art. Um, on a personal note, uh, I graduated from the school myself in 2008 and had the most amazing, amazing experience uh, being here. I know from firsthand how very intense it is. The first year is all about, uh, it's sort of an artist boot camp. It's all about acquiring the skills you need. Um, and the second year is where we ask you to take those skills and develop your own vision. Um, I also know what an important role drawing from the model, painting from the model, sculpting from the model plays at the school. It's at the heart of everything we do. Uh, so tonight is really a great example of what it's like to be in a class uh, at the school. I'll never forget my first day when I walked into a class and took up a pencil and started drawing with everybody. It was so quiet, you could have heard a pin drop. In fact, the only thing you could hear was the scratching of charcoal on paper. And people were so intent on what they were doing. At each break, we would walk around and look at each other's work. The first time we did that, the first time we circulated, I was literally blown away. I could not believe how good my fellow students were, how skilled they were, what kind of vision they were, and how unique everybody's style was. Um, it really set us a, a high standard uh, to get used to and to, to want to attain. I also couldn't believe how good the teachers were. I remember once being in a, in a painting class with Will Cotton, and he was showing us one of his, um, one of his tried and true techniques of almost painting um, stripes of color on skin to show a turning. And then he would paint them vertically, and then he would take a fan brush and drag it across horizontally, and voila, there would be incredible skin glowing and turning. Um, he showed it to us. I tried it. It worked perfectly. In fact, it worked so well, I did it three more times and ended up with just neutral gray mud. But this is a place to learn, a place to learn to, by failing and by succeeding and by learning from your fellow students as much as from the incredible faculty that we're surrounded with. Um, so that's it for me tonight. And next we go to Margaret or this jump into the questions, I think. Okay. Yeah. Who's up? All right. I was given a group of questions to ask the various artists. I know I can't imagine a more difficult thing to be doing than this, <laughs> for starters. But the questions are how do you start and when you start in a situation like this, what do you think about? Now, one of the thoughts that I have is if you were in a, this is a classroom situation mm -hmm. where you have the models already set up by a teacher. Mm -hmm. But your job mm -hmm. is to try to find something in that setup mm -hmm. that leads back to you. Sure, sure. Right. How do you do that? So, so initially, what, what I'll start with is just a, an overall connection with the person that I'm looking at. You know, that's very important to sort of take a moment just to see what kind of connection I have with the pose. And then I, in terms of the first initial strokes, I'll set about laying it down in a way that deals with placement, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about overall placement and then start to look for certain rhythms. I, I like to work from, you know, sort of top to bottom and find general rhythms that are flowing throughout. And one of the things I'm very impressed by is you've already got it placed well on the page and it already mm -hmm. looks like Dan no. <laughs> in 30 seconds. And I, I, when, what do you, what are your, mm -hmm. is your opinion of the work, the work mm -hmm. of, likeness in a work? Mm -hmm. How well, invaluable is it? I, I think that it, it really varies with project to project for me. Um, so the word, the word likeness, I think in a way, what, what I like to focus on a little bit more is more my intention with it. So there are going to be certain uh, moments, certain uh, uh, paintings that I do where, where recognizability is, is the goal. But then there are, there are other projects that completely have very little to do with, with the importance of, of, uh, of likeness. I think it's really more the artist's intention. I understand. Which is with, and, and the ideas that you bring to it that drive it. I know what impresses yeah. me is yeah. that you've put him slightly off center so mm -hmm. that basically what you're doing yeah. is dealing with the, conca the mm -hmm. basic concavity of his, his chest. Mm -hmm. He's sitting mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. That is the mm -hmm. message of the painting and I can read mm -hmm. it already. Oh. It's very impressive. Well, thank you. Can I ask you a couple mm -hmm. of technical sure. questions? Yeah. It looks like you're you're working on a prepared paper, mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. looks gessoed and then grounded with acrylic. 
Can yeah. you tell me, you, you chose not to work on canvas. Is right. this, when you're sketching, do you prefer it? Well, th this actually, this is a canvas. Um, uh, in a quick format, such as tonight, what I chose to do is rather than to pre-stretch the canvas, I wanted to, to sort of tape it on a board. So it sort of gives me the leeway to sort of decide and sort of push and pull the composition. Oh, so you uh, could actually when, when stretch it a little bit exactly. on a tighter so, canvas. Exactly. So this is a, a, an Antwerp, you know, Frederick's Antwerp uh, a, a linen canvas that's been taped down and, and as you mentioned correctly, uh, then toned with an acrylic uh, uh, white and black Liquitex. And um, you chose to make it somewhat translucent. Was mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why everybody else used a much darker sure, crayon? Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, it, it really varies. I think um, I like to have the background sort of breathe a little bit, and, and sometimes I feel that a transparent wash allows me to do that. And, and sort of because in this situation we weren't quite sure, you know, what how to express the environment, I wanted to leave it sort of a more open, a little more open. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, or mm -hmm. did you want to jump into some of like the tools here? No, I wanted to um, get a look at some of the other starts that are sure, going sure. on here. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. and we'll let Manu do yes. some do some work here. Thank you, um, <laughs> Alyssa. Will you tell us about your about your start here? Um, well, for me, color is going to be the way I find the whole thing, and mark making. So yeah. focusing on those two things. So with, so just kind of mapping out a quick sketch of really just plotted points to locate the composition, the face, a little bit of hopefully a little bit of uh, expression, and then just kind of using that same technique but with color now and bigger brushes and some thick paint. And start by establishing the lights. Well, yeah, I thought I'd get a head start by toning the canvas gray, because mm -hmm. I know the walls in here are white and they're gonna look gray in the background. So um, if I leave that side alone a little bit, I can start to build some volume with the lights first and then go from there, we'll see. Tell me about, um, your, about your thoughts on likeness. How important is that to you? Um, likeness isn't as important to me as the um, the kind of essence of the person. They like a, almost like the psychology of the person. So that that's what's exciting to me. So I try to key into that and draw it out and empathize with mm -hmm. the person. Mm -hmm. So if it looks like them, it's more because of their psychology, I hope, than their actual literal measurements. You know. Yeah. I guess you can get a, an exact likeness with a photograph that actually doesn't look like the person yeah, at all. For sure. We all yeah. have photographs that don't look like us, right? Yeah. So there's something about an actual likeness that doesn't, isn't really authentic in some yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. Great. We'll let you keep going. Okay. Thanks. Sophia, tell us about your start here. Okay. Um, Looks like you're diving right in with lots of paint and lots of color. Yeah, I'm trying to keep it abstract and open. I'm trying to use maybe bigger marks and shapes, kind of more bold colors. And as I kind of hone in on the portrait, maybe touch the surface less and less. That's my, mm -hmm. my game. Mm -hmm. Are you pre-mixing your colors or are you taking them straight out of the tube? Uh, I mix them a little bit here, but then a lot of mixing happens on the surface. As you drag the brushes on top of each other, it kind of weaves colors together. Like here you can see this pink and this bluish gray. They aren't maybe mixed in per se, but they're laying on top of each other in a way that you kind of visually mix it. Mm -hmm. That's a technique that I learned from Bernardo, actually. So. And on to Bernardo. Yeah. Margaret, do you have a question for you? Yes, I do. As I watch Bernardo paint, I'm reminded of a, of a story I heard about Sargent in this tight street studio that he wore out a channel in the floor from walking back and forth. Bernardo, when you are painting, are you, it seems to me that you're thinking of paint literally as flesh, almost not metaphorically, but literally, yeah. like you're building, you're building a relief. I, I really like the texture of uh, real flesh, the range of so many colors in, in skin. Skin tones, it's not pink, it's full of everything. And when you put those initial lines down to begin the painting, did you make a decision from the beginning that you were going to do him all the way down? I'm looking at where that would land to the labeling on his shirt, how did you make that decision? I mean, in, in general, it's not necessary. In this case, I knew I was going to paint him frontal. Got it. So, it's a, 
minor point of reference, which I using it in this case just to basically have, have an anchor to, to the ground. And to be honest, David and I were talking about it before, and we said we figured that was exactly the line of the eyebrows. Yeah. And it certainly is. Yeah. It, it feels very Velasquezian to me. So building a kind of monument of flesh. It could be a rock formation if you were a Martian. But it, it's, it's really quite impressive. Thank you. Can I tell me something, Bernardo? Do you think of yourself as an open form painter? And do you think differently about painting when you're painting from life as opposed to constructing uh, an image? I always work from general masses to details, step by step. So step one is basically vague stains that are mapping the territory. Uh, and slowly, it's like I am understanding the form I'm working on it slowly in the pro during the process. Sounds like a, a lens sort of sharpening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the focus. form is open because I want to keep everything open because all the time I need to adjust. I don't want to decide that shape is going to be like that at the beginning. It's something that is always changing and moving constantly. Yeah, yeah. So it gives you the most flexibility. Yes. So I really like mistakes because through those mistakes I can make it more alive and more vivid. And so that's why I need to change constantly the strokes on it. Yeah. Um, Manu, while, while we're on the subject of, of starting up, can you tell us about your palette, what colors you put out and yeah, why sure, and how sure. you arrange it? Absolutely. Um, so some of the colors that I have are, are both earth colors and prismatic, sort of a combination. And uh, But what I generally like to do when I'm working with on a figure or portrait is have uh, sort of a, a value arrangement from, from light to dark set up so that it, it gives me sort of the maximum ability to control form as I, as I want to turn form mm -hmm. as I keep going. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Alyssa, you have colors on here that I'm not even familiar with. <laughs> um, which ones are those? Well, like these, uh, these. That's my like favorite those. ever color. What is it? It's called Violet Gray by Old Holland, and it, it's, it's in everything. I think of it as the color of the air. It's re literally the atmosphere. Wow. So it, it shows up in the shadows, it shows up in the background, and it, um, it's a nice way to, like, kind of tone down your color without muddying it. It's uh -huh. like cleaning it uh -huh. almost. Wow. It's a beautiful color. Can I mention something before we go any further? We do have um, people visiting us on Facebook from Scotland, Canada, and New York City. If you have any interest in questioning or making comments to uh, the moderators, please just put your comments uh, in the comments section on Facebook. Thank you. And uh, Lisa, I noticed that your uh, set up a kind of pre-mixed palette. Is it the same thing that you do on every on every painting? No. Um, I had Dan sit for me for five minutes so I could just kind of look, yeah, get a general course. idea. Yeah. Um, but also, like, it's not really about an exact yeah. uh, match. It's more about the relationship between light and shadow in terms of color. Yeah. Uh, so color relationships really helped me a lot. Something I learned here, actually, yeah. um, that really creates space and volume uh, in a way that I, I feel really satisfied with, where, like, sometimes value isn't enough. Yeah. So I just wanted to create a few. So it's all about the relationships between the colors, tones, yeah. and values. Yeah. And um, what's your medium? What are you um, mixing with? Just a little mineral spirits right now because I can't open this jar of linseed oil <laughs> if anybody wants to help me with that. I'm sure, I'm sure you can get somebody to do that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but for right now, it's just a matter of loading. And actually, when I do start, I tend to make that first layer of paint very thick yeah. so that there's a lot of, uh, thanks, a lot of texture. And then working over that, the glazes will kind of highlight the texture. Yeah. So yeah, so it's fine if there isn't too much medium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you use a complementary co color system where the uh, light mass is d directly complementary to the no, shadow mass? Not necessarily. No. No, I try not to think in terms of the concepts. The systems. Like I don't even think in terms of warm and cool anymore. I just think of t the colors, like the exact color relationships, and then I stick to it. And sometimes I'll design a painting just because I like the two colors that are involved in the setup, or I'll set something up thinking this is going to be red and green, and then I'll make, you know, whatever adjustments to create the color relationships I want to see. Is there something, 
we're using a lot of Williamsburg paint tonight. Um, what are the kinds of things that you look for from a paint manufacturer? What, and the sides, like the pigmentation? And well, yeah, the, the saturation of it, yeah. the, um, that's good. But the, also the, um, the opacity. You know, sometimes it can be really anticlimactic when you get a new color and then you mix it with something else and it disappears. Yeah. So opacity is a big is a big factor. I also feel like there's you ha maintain a kind of buttery quality to your paint. Thanks. Like yeah, it's something that makes it feel almost juicy in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Is that intentional on your part? That's what happened to all the butter in France. Yeah. <laughs> That's why the, empty, the, the shelves are empty over there. You know, I think it's so delicious paint. Look, at, I mean, it looks. I don't taste it, but it looks so delicious and I want to get that quality. I think it's probably the medium that I use too, which is very little, but um, I use a DeMar medium made by Echo House and it maintains a certain kind of juiciness and shine as it dries. And real but it's, luminosity. It's, yeah. I mean, I think it's Old Holland too, that those colors are really vibrant. Mm -hmm. They really stand up. It's worth the, the money you have to pay for them. Right. Um, but with the sheen of the medium, it helps it stay wet looking, which helps. And it really is about putting paint on. You know, making color choices and then putting the paint on and letting it stay, not blending it all out. Yeah. I think that's probably the biggest factor. Sophia, I want to say that I've looked at your paintings and admired them for years, but it's, it's fascinating to watch you actually make one. She's working on a discarded canvas, something I tell every single student I have not to do. However, it's working out brilliantly. And if she's basically making this beautiful portrait of Michael against the action that was already laid out on the canvas itself. And one of the things I'm also very impressed by is a single brush stroke she's using on the side of the nose creates a three-dimensionality that really ha has sort of a cartoon feel, but a realistic one or naturalistic one all in one moment that makes it extraordinarily modern and, and beautifully effortless. It's really quite something, Sophia. Thank you. So we have a Facebook question. Uh, somebody out in Facebook land wants to know, if the, and this is for all the artists, do you have a preferred scale of canvas that you'd like to work on, especially for a pose like this? Would you have chosen differently um, if you were working by yourself or anything like that? Manu? Sophia, how about you? Is that a scale that you're comfortable with? Or this did you just find that canvas? Small. I, I had this canvas at the house, but I think I might go maybe 18 by 20 instead of 16 by 20. Mm -hmm. That's what I like to do portraits on. You know, what, what she's describing are the traditional 16 by 20, 20 by 24s. But they are, I think what the person's asking, the kinds of paintings that somebody is capable of doing on site, looking at a, real, at a model, are not huge. You, because you must be able to literally connect with the view that you have of the model, and that is the information you have. To get larger information, you have to go much closer, and that's usually used when they use photographs. Mm -hmm. um, I like big paintings. <laughs> I like making big paintings. In general. Paintings. <laughs> yeah. Um, I generally like to blow things up bigger than they are. I've been recently trying to work at a life-size scale, and I find it challenging. But I like challenges too, so I don't know. Do you so do that from life? No. Yeah, I thought so. See, no, but I've been using more imagination, uh, which I think is um, probably the, my favorite part so far of, of my painting career, it's working from imagination. What is the largest piece you've done? And did you feel like you were more immersed in it because it was so large? Um, I think it was probably about eight and a half feet wide. Um, yeah, I feel like it, it, I don't know, I feel comfortable with it. I don't feel, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't remember how, I don't remember feeling overwhelmed or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like the challenge of it. I like the feeling like I'm inside the paint. I wish it could just be a three-dimensional right. all around me. That would be perfect. So if not, then just make it bigger. I want to ask Bernardo a question about size because when I tour the studios here, I can always tell when somebody's taking one of Bernardo's class classes because I walk in and all of a sudden I'll see enormous uh, life-size paintings. Bernardo, tell us, what, tell us your thoughts on size. 
I mean, it depends what type, what type of painting you're going to do. See if it's uh, related with figures or landscapes or size matters also in relationship with subject matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I need to paint a portrait, I wish I can stay slightly bigger than life size. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit, I need an int because that makes me more flexible and comfortable in, in waving my hands. We did a wonderful um, three-person portrait for a show we put together this summer. And um, what size was that, Bernardo? That was big. I don't know in, in inches. I know in centimeters. Oh, well, like, was it like 10 feet or? Uh, maybe, 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 feet? maybe 11, 11 yeah. feet by nine, something like that. Bigger than life size. Right? Bigger, than, way yeah. bigger than life size. Yeah, yeah. three figures. Yeah. And how long so. did that take you? Several months, on and off. Yeah, very oh. difficult painting. Yeah, the result was worth it. Thank you. I just got a question from someone in the audience that says, "Why do you tell students not to paint on discarded canvas?" And this is a very, for me, there's I teach naturalistic painting techniques and one of the things that I'm trying to do is to get them to respect the ground. I take people to the Met and one of the things I do at the Met is walk people around and show them paintings and, and let them see the weight of the paint on the canvas. A lot of times there's very little paint on that painting and a lot of it has to do, the depth of the painting has to do with the way you've got a, a very thin glaze or two or three on the ground itself and the ground is still interacting. If you work on a painting that's already filled in, the ground's gone. A lot of, one of the biggest problems I think we have is that even though we have students in New York, they don't go to museums. So you look at paintings in books or you look at them online and therefore Caravaggio, all the darknesses look like black. They are not. They are transparent, translucent. So therefore you have to see the actual one. That's why I'm emphasizing the importance of the ground because if you go in and nail that ground too quickly, you have no possibility of making any of those sorts of decisions. Now with Sophia's situation, that I already looked before we started tonight, it's a very thin ground and Sophia paints a la prima and very heavy. So it's not really sort of the same thing I'm talking about, but I could make that ground work because it's still very thin on the canvas. But picking up cheap canvas and trying to work into it, canvas has only so much life. I like to think of it like a surgeon with an open, a person with an open chest, you've got so many hours in there and you're out. It dies. I mean, it, it, you can't, oil paint is something people think they can just paint and paint and paint. You and paint. can tell we're, we're very serious at this school. We are it's very serious at this school. And somebody yeah. actually teaches that. Yeah, so, so. Um, I have a question from uh, Amy Hughes, who's a recent graduate who's watching on Facebook right now from the United Kingdom. And it's a question for my fellow moderators here. Um, Peter, how would you have approached this particular painting? I know your techniques are and what your, your you know, way of going is very different. Yeah, I mean, I also tend to start on a neutral ground, but um, very much like Alyssa, I tend to focus on the light masses for a long, long time. I don't even deal with the shadow masses until I feel like I've established a, a really successful turning of form and developing a, the sort of color st strategy. Um, the, one of the things I do struggle with is like how much to let the ground come through. It always feels frustrating to me if the ground disappears altogether because it feels like what's the point of having a ground if you're just going to obliterate it. Yeah. Margaret. Yeah, I completely agree with Peter. I always say to people when, it's, when they're, they're doing underpainting, it's like the thin relief on a dime. Where the light is highest, you want the heaviest amount of paint and then you want it to trail off just like that thin bar relief does to the ground. The ground is incredibly important. If you lose that, a lot of times you've lost the painting. How about you, David? Uh, probably with all these cameras and people here, just with utter panic <laughs> would be how I would approach it. <laughs> no, I would, I would always try, uh, for me it's all about going from the general to the specific and trying to map out the main, you know, light forms, light masses and not really getting too committed to anything in particular till I'm just 100% satisfied that I've done all that investigation and it's where I want it to be. So for me, the first stages of the painting are really about that, that structure and composition and the freedom to change it a lot for a long time. Like many artists, the two of us have discussed 
when a painting is at its most lively. And I know that we both felt there have been times when you've lost the painting because you've gone too far with it, and then you have to sort of retrieve it again. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, are you talking to me or Margaret? Uh, you, David. You know, there's definitely times when um, I have put a painting away for a long time because I feel that I've, I've pushed it too far and tried to get really too specific in details that really don't matter in the end. Mm -hmm. So I find if I put it away for a while and come back to it, it's very easy for me to see those things with a fresh eye. Um, I also sometimes will take, uh, you know, some kind of glaze or something and just cover the entire painting with it or I'll sand it down to get rid of the details and then to sort of have a ghost of something to start on mm -hmm. again. And I always find it's amazing what muscle memory you have with that. Great. You know, you're, you get attached to things and you're afraid to let them go because you think, oh, I won't be able to create that again. Yes. But, you know, it comes right back. Margaret. It's true, and also um, usually better the second time. It's like when you lose something on the computer and you think, Lord, I'm going to kill myself, and then, and then you have to write it, but it becomes much more succinct and clearer the second time. Yeah. I've got a question that says, what are special problems with painting a huge portrait? Because I do them. Do you paint a lot of time painting a smaller work and scale it up? The most important part about this is, yes, you must paint the smaller one first, and then I want to say this about scaling it up. I do not eyeball scaling it up. I photograph it, I put it on a projector, and I project up. And then I look at the fact that I must use different tools then. The worst thing that happens to me when I'm a teacher, I'll go into a studio, terrific sketch. Student's going to scale it up. He, uses, he or she uses exactly the same tools they used on, on the one that's, that's very small. The scale, think about um, some of the better painters that you've seen. They'll use huge brush strokes, massive brush strokes. Those are also the implements they're using and stretching it in. If you scale up, you must scale up your tools as well. And the reason that I project is because I cannot imagine. I always mess it up if I eyeball it. That would be the most distinct thing I could say. <laughs> you know, Margaret, it's interesting because you just brought up the subject of photography, and you're photographing your own yes. work and then translating it. Yes. Um, Alyssa, can I ask you about the relationship to photography in, in some of your work? Yeah. Um, I use um, photography to make a composition generally and also to come up with, well, to start a palette, but mainly it's a compositional tool and I can do a lot of work in Photoshop with collaging and moving things and cropping and things like that. So once I settle on a composition, that's pretty much not going to change, but then I'll use the, the, my imagination and memory and imagination to create the texture and decide how much detail to include. So, I mean, I think it's important to know the limitations of a photographic reference. One know? of the things I've always heard about your workshops, um, which are very popular and highly attended, Thanks. and uh, is that you teach people how to use the photograph and then how to get rid of it yes. as it goes on. Can you tell us some of the techniques for making sure you're not tied to a photograph? You know, I, I tell my students to try to imagine the photograph um, that they're using. Imagine the painting that would come from it. And if it's too ambitious to think of their own style, try to, try to think of their favorite painter. This way they can start to um, imagine and uh, visualize what the end result would be. And then um, the, I do other exercises with them where I, I make them work really, really small. And they can't put all that information in. I make them do little sketches first, too so that they Make learn to edit. small with big brushes? Or, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. The most painful as it can get. But the idea is to learn what it is about the composition in the photo that's most useful and get that and then ignore all the other stuff because the photo inundates you with detail. And if you go after detail before structure, it's too much. It doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah. 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 Uh, on the subject of brush size, Manu, I notice in your... Can you zoom in on her brushes? I notice uh, mm -hmm. you're using, in contrast to everybody else, a mm -hmm. lot of very small brushes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like soft brushes, too. Sure. Sorry. A lot of soft brushes. Softer brushes, too. Yeah. I, I've started to sort of, um, you know, it, in, in, again, sort of the quick format that we have tonight, I'm sort of maybe moving a little bit, little bit faster than I normally would, so I'm using sort of a synthetic 
brush to get started on. Uh, it, sometimes I'll work with bristles if the, the surface is a little bit of a thicker canvas. Um, and I know, I've, yeah, I have the, a lot of these little brushes here, but they won't come till much later. You know, in general, I like to keep the, those the are finessing very, brushes. Exactly, they're the, they're, they're the final touches if we get to them, you know. So, uh, so right now, I'm, I'm using sort of bigger brushes. So we do have a Facebook question for you. Sure. Is this your standard palette, or do you adapt your palette for each circumstance? It really will be adapted for each circumstance. Um, when I'm, you know, there are certain paintings that I do that really would, would be completely the, the sort of magic of the painting would be lost if I premixed too much. Mm -hmm. So uh, mostly when I'm working with the, the figure or with the portrait, I, I like to premix, but in many circumstances I don't, and I'll sort of adapt the colors accordingly as well. Do you, like Alyssa, have a couple of colors that are like old friends that you have to have on the palette no matter what? Sure, sure. I mean, recently I've, um, well, from Wade Schumann, actually, who uh, teaches in the MFA program, he sort of introduced me to flesh ochre, which was uh, something I've really enjoyed by Old Holland. And then dioxazine purple, cerulean blue. I love dioxazine purple. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a perfect black because it still exactly. maintains a lot of color. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it works well. Do you well. use a lot of transparent chromatics? Um, I, I, I do. I sort of tend to mix them up, however, with the with titanium white. So sometimes they're used transparently. It really more depends on the value of it, since they're darker values. Sure. Mm -hmm. I just have to butt in for one mm -hmm. second here. I'm, I'm noticing mm -hmm. something in Alyssa's painting right now where she's laying in shadows with um, a, a pretty warm reddish, like flesh ochre color. So is that is that a standard thing for you, Alyssa? So it's not it's not a standard thing. It's just so it's responding to this tonight. We'll check back in on these warm shadows later. Yeah, please. Mm. Give me a chance. I've been asked by the audience to ask the same question that was asked of me, of the artist here. Do you start with a small piece, for, for example, and then scale up to make a larger painting? No. I didn't think you did, because this no. is about the scale of your work. You have a scale with which you are comfortable, and this is a scale whether it's a large painting or a small yes. piece. Yes. I, I, used, so. I used to make very sketch, many sketches, very, many studies when I was younger. Because I needed to understand maybe the composition. Now I don't need it. If I do it, it's because I like to do it, but not because I, I need understand. it. I understand. No, I've just been very impressed in watching you scratch out the eyes in the concavity under the eyebrows. I'll admit that in front of television cameras, I would not have those guts. That is very impressive. Um, Sophia, do you, I know you don't, but do you, if you're going to make a larger piece, this is basically the scale. You're, you work at the point with the large painting where you're going to be in the end. You don't do a small sketch and then pull it up? Well, recently I've been working on, a, on my process and I found that doing large-scale charcoal drawings is really helpful. But now, now when I start painting, if it needs to be bigger, I always look at the painting I'm doing that it's the final piece. Mm -hmm. But um, I always end up repeating myself so it gets done again and again. And so it, Looking back, it's like the other paintings felt feel like studies. Looking back, if that makes sense. Also, your charcoal sketches feel like entirely, in my opinion, like entirely different bo a body of work. They don't feel like studies for paintings. I think the way you work is you sort of learn the terrain with a charcoal sketch and then go into a bigger painting with the same, as if you're walking up the same hill, but it's not transferring one image to another, correct? Yeah, I'd say that. So you've been working so much from your imagination the past two years. <clears throat> Have you been working also from observation at the same time, Sophia? Yeah, I've been trying to incorporate a little bit of everything because I think there's something beautiful about confusing yourself and putting yourself in a state of, well, confusion, loss of control. So going back and forth between painting something from imagination and finding a reference that fits what you started, and then, uh, yeah, working from life even. It's, it's, it's good to, I think, go through it all in the same image. 
Do you enjoy one more than the other? I mean, it seems like there's almost kind of a release that happens with some of your more distorted figures. Yeah, I think there's definitely an emotional release that happens there. But when I'm working on something possibly more representational, more from life, it's another release, too. There's a relief that I don't have to invent. The invention comes from the technical, and that's fun. Sophia, you were always inventing. That's a wonderful – the way you walk the path over and over is always a new way. Thanks. You know what's interesting to me, fellow moderators? We were talking about likeness before, and I'm looking at all four of these paintings at this stage. They all look like the person that they are painting, and none of them look like each other, which is so interesting that people are chasing exactitude a lot of times in likeness, and you see here a range of results that all capture it without being anything like each other. Well, it's one of the things that I think makes the Academy what it is, because everybody's getting the same tool set, but they're not applying it the same way. They're not being asked to apply it the same way. It's just what you do with that skill set is up to you. And it's so exciting for me to see people come in, get exactly the same thing, and then just become 55 different artists. I often think of it like learning a vocabulary when you come here. First you're learning individual words, then sentences, and eventually you're combining those sentences into a story, your story, and every person's is different. It's also interesting for me – it sounds like I'm shilling here, but I'm not. It's like the design of the sequencing of the classes is set in such a way that the drawing will help your anatomy, the anatomy will help your painting. The art and culture classes help you become a more sophisticated artist. They're all sort of like pushing and developing each other. Yes, I agree with that. I remember when I finished school here, I felt like it took me a year to just sort of sift through everything I had learned and assemble it into useful knowledge for me because there was so much. It was such a gift. And as I've been asked another question, what is your advice for conveying shadows in a portrait? All right. I'm painting naturalistically usually, so what I do is the age-old stuff. I go in on a light gray canvas, exactly like Manu was here, streaky gray canvas. I sketch the piece out in loose raw umber, and by that I mean very wet, a lot of turpentine in it, so it feels like watercolor. Then I start the old – the thing I said before, like building it like a dime. What Peter was just talking about, again, plugging our procedure, this is painting one, where you basically are put in front of a model and said, paint a la prima. Go after it. And what we're trying to get you to do in that moment is understand hot and cold. My kids ask me, what's the best color? And I said, the color is not the important part. It's the heat, what's hot and what's cold. We're going to read the shadows. It's like the relief on a map. If you – basically, if you're painting in a north light, your lights are going to be – light are going to be cool, and your shadows are going to be warm. That's basically what you're seeing when you walk through the map. When you're in a painting studio, though, with artificial lights, that's going to be reversed. The point is to be consistent so that when we are looking at your piece, we understand how to read shadow from light, all right? After I sketch in with the – what I'm talking about is the painting two curriculum. That's what I do. The – on a gray piece like this, I'll sketch in the piece, then I'll go in and lay in – I do – I'll admit I don't do it strictly in Brizai. I go in with a part of the original color that's going to be used, the ambient color. But I do make it much thicker where the light's going to hit, and I trail it off, just like the relief of a dime, when it's going to go into that shadow. Bernardo, can I ask you a question? Talk to me about blending colors and paint. Do you do that on your palette? Do you do it on the canvas? I don't blend. Basically, I don't blend. I like marks evident. And I like – Strokes. Strokes. I like – you feel that there is some blending, but there is no blending. But you feel united and, and, and round, even though when you get closer, everything is actually made by – different divided strokes right. that combine together give you this magic feeling of blending, but it's not blended. So it remains about painting. But you are blending color before you put it onto the canvas. 
I'm mixing color. You're mixing color, and then, yeah, okay. So you're not blending it once it gets on it. I prefer to jump on it every each time with different marks, different yeah. colors, different tones, and hoping it's going to be fine. Yeah, so that every color there has layers beneath it. Yes. Coming through. Yes. I have a question for the two alumni here. So Sophia and Manu, uh, we have a Facebook question. Who were your mentors here at school, and what do you think you learned most from those mentors? How about you, Manu? Sure. Um, well, two of them are up on the stage. You know, I uh, <laughs> had the great fortune of taking a workshop with Michael and a class, drawing class with Dan. Uh, so that was uh, uh, the, the things that I gained from their classes had largely to do with, with uh, proportion and structure, you know, anatomy and composition. Um, I also had a great fortune of, of working with Stephen Assell. But I honestly have to say that, that, you know, after I graduated, you know, as David was saying, it takes um, sometimes a, a couple of years almost to process everything that you've ever gained from a program. And I, looking back, I can honestly say, truthfully, that I, I really can, can find very valuable little nuggets from every single person that I, that I studied with here. So. Sophia, how about you? I have to agree with that. I think every single class really had something to offer. Um, in terms of mentors, definitely really connected with the way Bernardo thinks about painting with the attitude. I'd say he had a huge effect on you. Huge effect. And then um, also Margaret Bowen, of course. I really liked how she can get excited about so many different ideas. And I love that Monica Cook helped me embrace my inner weirdo. And I like uh, Every really artist like has Dan. an inner weirdo, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I love all the art and culture classes, too, because they helped me understand the context of what I was, what I was doing, why it was so powerful. It was great. Well, the artists, I mean, well, the models are on break. Can I ask you guys a couple of questions? Can you come over here? No, the, the models. So, um, Michael, what's it like to be on the other side? It's very novel. It's a, it's a new experience a little bit. Um, I've done this before. Uh, the way I look at it is the artist-model relationship is really a collaboration, always. Um, and I, so I really enjoy actually sitting for the portraits. It's great. How about you, Dan? How's it feel? It feels great listening to your dialogue. So. <laughs> I mean, it might be more challenging if it was just silence because you're stuck with your own thoughts in your own head. But listening to your thoughts in your head is kind of fascinating. We sometimes talk about what makes a great model in the life room. It, it seems a consensus that a great model knows how to emit. And so I, I don't know how to do that. I'm not sure I'm qualified. But um, thinking about the, 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 the sort of energy in the room and trying not to look stale, I, I find I can't sit totally still or I'll go stale. So. I think with the, with the idea that we're collaborating with these guys too is part of it where we're not, we're not apathetic about this. We've all had unfortunate situations where you've had an apathetic model, right? And other ones where you're completely inspired and really feeding off of each other. So, and I think that we're just really jazzed about this. So. Can I ask you a question also? I mean, the complaint I hear the most from faculty members about models is the ones that just can't sit still or they'll fall asleep and are you at all more sympathetic to models now, just from a, a longish pose like this? Yeah, but you know, somebody who can't totally sit still, you can see around the form, so it's not like a photograph. You, know, you get this wonderful kind of vision within reason. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily bad. Within reason. It, within reason, if, if you can see around the forms, yeah. I think everybody should do this, too, uh, to really get an appreciation for what occurs. Uh, what goes into modeling and things like that. Yeah. How does it feel to be looked at? Oh, it's fine. <laughs> what about you, Dan? I get looked at by my kids a lot, so I'm, I'm okay <laughs> with it. Are you at all curious to just, like walk around the canvases and see, or do you feel like that would have an, a, a, a biased effect on the painters? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. What do you think? You, you looked already. It didn't count. I, I, I can't know. help but peek. I, I'm, I'm just really... Yeah, I'm stunned in this very short amount of time um, yeah. up there, what's, what's occurring. So. 
Yeah, I feel that way too. I feel like I'm stunned by the um, the results already in this short amount of time. It's incredible. I've been asked a question by the audience, and I'd like to put it right now. They, they say, do you believe a painting must get worse before it gets better? One of the things that it's important that we create scenes like this, settings like this, is so that you can see a work in progress. I'm self-taught because there was not a school like that. I'm so old, there was not a school like this when I was a kid. And did not know the very important fact of where I was in the process. So I threw away paintings that were just in the middle. I didn't know, I thought they were, they were ruined. But I looked back at them after a while and I realized that's why you need a scenario, that's why you need a teacher to show you, no, it's, it, it's not supposed to get worse before it gets better, it stays in large masses before it goes to detail. I started painting with one eye, I would finish one eye on a six by four foot canvas then make a measure over to the nose and paint the next eye and go like a snail. Now you can imagine the disaster. But I had no other I had no other way to work. But you're now watching, I'm looking at Alyssa right now, lay this this canvas in. She has not gone in with any of the detail into the eyes or the mouth, but I already not only do I feel Dan in this, I feel a mood to him. And I also have the way she's situated his head on the canvas is already giving me a feeling of what she feels when she looks at this man. That's the important part. No, a painting doesn't get worse before it gets better. It comes up in stages. So Margaret, how did you break that impasse where you were talking about, you know, Truthfully, the, the how you were painting going about it wrong? All right, before 9-11, you could walk into the Met with a bag and nobody said a word. I would make little paintings and go in and pull them out of my bag and put them up against the paintings I was trying to emulate. And it was, of course, a disaster. Um, but I would then go home and pick a painting, like a Dega. That was the first thing I did, success, or sort of successfully, was a Dega. And I, I chose a model and put the model in the same position as the Dega painting was. And I did my own work with the same lighting and tried to emulate his painting, but using my own figure. I love that. So you were making those old masters teach you currently, yes. Yes. even if they weren't better. around. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So, Manu, I have one more technical question for you. Is the fact that you put this canvas on a board so that you don't have the spring of canvas? I see everybody else's brush bouncing off the, you know, the stretch canvas. Yeah. Yeah. Flexibility around composition, but. Uh, but yeah, having having some of the resistance gives me a little bit of snap with the brushes, right. um, and uh, and also the the kind of paint that I have uh, on the canvas, which is a little bit more thickly applied, is from uh, Williamsburg. So mm -hmm. they have this really really nice uh, consistency to them. I think the quality of the paint has a lot to do with with. Um, uh, the, the filler versus the actual pure pigment. So, sure. so with Williamsburg, I, I also get that sort of the the nice like click on the brush on the you know right. hard surface. Yeah. And you, mm -hmm. I've always thought of you as a mm. closed form painter yeah. who <laughs> is still atmospheric. Uh -huh. Is that something that you strive for in your work? Um, well, I I do. Atmosphere is very very important for me to achieve. I largely think about you know edge handling and how to. Uh, how to inject sort of that third dimension that we're looking for, projection and recession. Mm -hmm. So uh, so working in a more closed form manner is, uh, gives me a little bit more flexibility with the with edge handling. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Alyssa, can I interrupt you for a sec? Yeah. So you're an academy alum, but who were your uh, teachers and who were your biggest influences? Well, um, what really was the deciding factor was looking at Vincent Desiderio's work. I mean, this is now 19 years ago I started here. And uh, it was him that, you know, I looked at his work and I thought, this, this is what I want to learn. I need to talk to this guy, so I'm in. Um, but as I got here, you know, I had these fantastic conversations with all my faculty members. Um, Wade Schumann was helpful. Um, you know, watching them paint was the best. I mean, watching Vince paint, you could really feel like, the, the pressure of the brush and the sensitivity to the material, and that changed everything for me. 
and subtlety. We yeah. thought it was, you know, interesting. It's yeah. amazing, right? What about the, uh, can, can you boil, I, you, I know you learned so much while you're here. Can you, can you give us a couple of your biggest takeaways from your time um, here? Certainly subtlety, which I had no clue uh, that there was more values than just light and dark. Mm -hmm. Turns out there is there's more to the, to the value scale than that. And that was a big thing that Vince helped me with. Um, understanding the turnings, that was Wade, he helped me with that. Um, and Half Light, you know, that was both of them really. Um, John Jacobs Meyer helped me think a little bit more analytically about mm -hmm. my work. Um, God, I don't want to leave anybody out. Mm -hmm. Gosh. You'll, you'll have more. We'll, we can come back to it. Yeah. There's a lot of great There's influences here. There's so much. Here. Yeah. yeah. Bernardo. Yes. Tell me. Tell us about your training and how you uh, how you developed your painting technique. I am a self-taught. I started painting when I was very young, in my house, my parents' house in Italy, a long time ago. My first teacher was my mother. Your mother was a painter. Uh, she was an illustrator, but she was skilled and she was very smart in giving me nice good tips when I was young. And, and then I basically kept painting. I didn't go to any school. The first time I went to a school was as a teacher here at the academy. Um, um, I looked at many, many paintings from uh, museums, galleries, and contemporary artists from the past trying to figure it out, how to paint. I remember the first time I made a, an oil on canvas. I was very, very young. And instead of using linseed oil or stand oil, I used um, olive oil. <laughs> so the That's you're Italian. <laughs> Maybe. The painting is still wet, I think. And it's about 30 years ago. That's great. I have a Facebook question for everybody. Um, <clears throat> In general terms, the question is, when is it appropriate to use a projector, or is it ever appropriate to use a projector? Thank you, Manu. Well, I think that um, projectors in and of themselves are not evil. What I look to do, I, I myself do not project. I've, I've come away from that to just really do my own preliminary sketches first. I think if you're projecting your own work, that, you know, your own preliminary sketches, there's, there's something that's a little bit more in touch with what your intention is. So uh, I think where, where it's just a labor saving device, really. Exactly. And I think, I think, you know, being able to, to save some time is, is, is there's certainly nothing evil with about projectors. But, uh, but for the most part, I think it's especially useful if it, if it doesn't take away from, from from what your idea is and what your intention is. That yeah. seems to be, I mean, I've mm -hmm. heard that from a number of artists over the years that project, you know, doing a drawing, you know, a line drawing just to sort of lay out a composition mm -hmm. and then using the projector to project, that just makes sense, you know, because mm -hmm. it's just a pain in the ass to blow the thing up. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Alyssa, how about you? Um, I think there's a, there's a trap in, in a projection a little bit because you can get too tight and to marry to those lines. So I think there's a way to use it, just like there's a way to use photography. Um, if you project and you get, you know, like a mass of a shape or uh, some kind of just note the shadows and things, that can be really useful. But if you're in there, I think for me personally, if you're in there trying to get every single thing, then you seize up in the painting process because you got these lines and you feel like you have to maintain them. So I think it's, it's like anything else, use in moderation, I would say. I'm always surprised how quickly, if you're using photographic references, you actually just stop using them. You know what I mean? Like you sort of use it to block something out. Yeah. But the actual fun of painting is the invention inside of exactly. those forms. Exactly. I mean, if you can visualize it, that image you have behind your eyelids is so much more interesting and exciting and in, in it makes create, uh, curiosity, you know, it festers the curiosity. So that's better, you know. The photograph can be dangerous because it shows you the outcome before you've even started. And if you're, you know, kind of married to that outcome, you're just a machine. And it's pr frequently pretty stupid information. Right. Limited the, information. Yeah, the camera doesn't uh, decipher bone structure or um, 
all the really interesting things that make a person, like the, like the psychology or the essence, really. You have to pull that out. Peter, a uh, question for you. A lot of your uh, work, in fact, the work for your upcoming show in Chicago is based on a lot of um, film stills and, and um, things from old TV programs and stuff. Did you project some of those images? Anything where I was looking for, like, absolute verisimilitude, which in the case of the television shows was what I was looking for, I projected. But then when I end up comparing it to the original source material, it changes so much because of the process that I use and because of the goals that I'm seeking. So it strays from that verisimilitude almost immediately. Yeah. Uh, the thing that always surprises me about projectors, and I've tried it a couple of times, is how quickly you run out of the information. Yeah. You know, it's like you, you can get something projected uh, as, as a line drawing, but very quickly you're back on your own. Right. You, can, you can't keep relying on that image. Yeah. I agree with you. I think that it's, it's pretty much death to project a photograph. You have to, pro you have to go through the process and then project your own piece. Otherwise, you, I always say to my, I go from stu studio to studio and I'm looking at, at a laptop. Somebody's projecting a photograph. And my point is there are three million people in China that can do this right now. So you've got to figure out a way to make this yours. So let's do it before we project it to a six foot by eight foot canvas. I would ask a question, what is the most important to you? Palette, stroke, direction, feeling. What defines your style? Um, all right, the, the clearest thing I could say about this is I think about the fact that our modern palettes are built coming out of Impressionism when they had 55 different kinds of colors sitting in front of them. I'm also a pastel artist, so pastel is different because you do literally need um, 55 colors in front of you because you're cross-hatching. But in, when you think about oil painting, the old masters had one guy mix it up for him in the morning. He made five colors. So that's it. And then one of the things I do when I take people to the Met is say there aren't 35, even looking at Lucian Freud, folks, there is a much more reduced, he's thinking about the large masses, he's thinking about hot and cold. The exact palette, to be honest with you, changes from day to day, but what I'm always thinking about is the left side of the palette's got hot, the right side of the palette's got cold. And the decisions are being made in terms of the subject matter. Um, as to what kinds of paints I use. I use Williamsburg paint. I used to use Robert Doak until he went out of business and I found out Williamsburg's just as good. And I also use blocks. Um, and also um, Da Vinci. I use all different kinds of paints. Whenever I'm an, a, a teacher in a class and I'll say use a color, I realize that the name on the tube is different for every manufacturer. So you have to start, a raw sienna is a different color depending on what, what manufacturer you've got. So you have to start to, win. that's why I think hot and cold, so that I have a large range from which to work. I mean, st and stroke and direction has to do with form, folks. Whenever I'm looking, I take people to look at the Bathsheba and the Met. If you look at any Rembrandt, the stroke of the form, the, of an arm, is, is talking about the motion of the muscle. It's talking about the insertion. There's no streaking like this. The motion of the brushwork is talking to you about the form. Medium is the message. It all holds together at once all the time. And the feeling, frankly, is not something I think you can determine ahead of time. It happens. But you're not saying that the, um, that the, the this brush stroke is following the form the whole time. Actually, I am, Dev. I mean, I'll, I'll, if I've got a large piece, for example, in pastel, though, it's an interesting point. In pastel, there's three different levels of pastel. There's really soft, middle, and sharp. And I'll block in a large pastel, you're right, like in just masses of tone. And I'm only starting to think about the form when I start going in to the middle range pastels and to the smallest ones. But they must, almost like, um, well, David's, I mean, Peter does it. All of the marks when I'm looking at a painting of his, half, they are all in service of the form that I'm looking at, whether it's a drum, the head of a little girl, the mother next to her. The literal brushwork I'm looking at is in the same world as the form itself. It's an, it's an interesting point, and I, I, I take your point about it being in service of the form, but not actually necessarily following the form. Like I'm looking at Bernardo's work here right now, and you know the strokes are going a, a lot of times in violent opposition to the 
the form. And so I think, uh, you know, it, both can work. No, I hear you. I hear you. I've just been asked to, to ask to st shut up and ask the, the artist more questions. Manny, what do you think about, what, what do you, mm. Mike, what do you think mm -hmm. about in terms of the same questions we were, we were talking about? Sure. Brushwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that brushwork, um, I sort of work in a similar way to, to what you were describing, where especially in, in more of a, um, a quick uh, sit situation such mm -hmm. as, as this, I'm really looking to, to bring a vitality to the, to the brushwork and wrapping it around forms, Wrap really it. thinking about, about you know, pulling up like, you know, certain forms that, that are in the chin or, or what have you, just to really have them help describe the form. You know, when I look at it, mm -hmm. I can see it done in clay. You know, immediately mm -hmm. in terms of the plank. Mm -hmm. Alyssa, mm -hmm. let's go around the room. I'm not saying other people can do this, but everybody mm -hmm. wants you all to, to talk about the answer to this question. The brushwork? The question is, what's most important to you? Palette, stroke, direction, feeling. Yes. <laughs> no, I hear you. I hear you. I, I hear you. Um, Be a little yeah. more explicit. Yeah, I mean, really, all three of those things really matter. I don't know that we need to hierarchy. Well, I don't think they're asking for hierarchy. I think they're asking for how does one serve the other. I think the color relationships for me are a technical thing. So that's like the Apollonian. That's the organization. That's the mm -hmm. way to get to create a container. The emotional part is, and the brushwork, Frank, well, actually, the brushwork is where the emotions come through, and that's the Dionysian. That's the chaotic energy. That's the four-year-old kid who wants to play, and that's where the emotion is coming through. So I feel like... I agree know, with you. You need them all. There you go. Done. Sophia, there's a Facebook question for you. Um, what was the hardest thing when you came to the academy for you to unlearn? To unlearn. Huh. Well, to unlearn. I had to. I think when I came to the academy, I was so ready for a change that I was just desperate to learn anything. And I kind of let go of everything. What I had to learn was how to trust myself and believe in it, in my, I don't know, vision or an idea, carry it through to the end and be okay with what it was, kind of accept it. Um, that's what I learned. I don't know if it's more unlearning or learning. Bernardo, will you talk to us about the question of, uh, of brush stroke, following form, dissecting form, all that kind of thing? I think everything is important, same way. There is no one thing better than the other. You need to combine the way you draw, the way you paint, the way you use your brushes, the way you manipulate texture, the way you combine warm and cool, the way your eyes are capable to resume in few strokes something that is so complex in front of your eyes. So it's a very complicated job. So it's the, the range of tools you need to use are many and you need to have a sort of uh, control and lose control with them all the time. I don't think there is one thing more important than the other. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Mike uh, writing in on Facebook and he's asking, do you listen to music while you paint and does it influence your work? I listen to music. I blast music when I paint. You blast music. What do you blast? I blast. I mean, I study music, classical music, but I tend to avoid classical music when I'm painting because I like it too much. I get too much emotionally involved. So I tend to put very stupid songs. <laughs> like? I don't know. You name it. Wh whatever. Any, anything very silly. Purple that, Rain? Yeah. Purple Rain, I like that. Sophia, do you listen to music? Uh, sometimes. It just depends. Depends on the mood. Alyssa, what do you do? What do you listen to? Yeah, I'd say depending on where I am in a picture, sometimes the music helps me, you know, just kind of get out of my own head, um, and that's good. But other times, I need to be more focused. So, I don't know, maybe a podcast could kind of be the right amount of distraction and not too much. I don't know. How about you, David? I love listening to music while I paint. I like listening often to um, world music not necessarily stuff I know, so that it, I, I, I'm not attached to it or following it. It's more creating a environment for me. What about you, Manu? Do you listen to music? Absolutely. <laughs> I do. And I, I, 
it, it really just depends sometimes on the, the kind of painting that I'm working on. If there's something that's more atmospheric or loose, I'll, I'll completely uh, listen to some pretty crazy stuff. But then, but then like Alyssa was saying, if, if there are more quiet, quiet moments that I need, I might put on some classical music or listen to a podcast. But, yeah. Stone cold mm -hmm. quiet. No music, <laughs> no voices, no neighbors, just mm. absolute silence. I can't work any other way. And just the loudness of your own thoughts. <laughs> That's nasty. I want to ask you guys, uh, everyone here is painting in oil. Do you uh, choose always to paint in oil over acrylics? This is a Facebook question also. Yes. I like oil. I think uh, I used to paint with acrylic, and the more I painted with it, the more I kind of understood that I was painting with plastic and how much it was holding me back from experiencing the translucency and the vibrancy of oil paint, and also the t amount of time that I could spend on something. I could oil increase gives the you time. A lot more time. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy the oil paint more now. Bernardo, did you ever work in acrylic? No, I really don't know how to do it. And I think Peter is a genius by using the way he is able to manipulate texture with acrylic such a difficult type of material. I have a question for Bernardo. How do you respond to your own repeated painterly tendencies or tropes? Huh? What, Excuse me, can you repeat? It says, how do you respond to your own repeated painterly tendencies or tropes? What do you do when you feel that your style has become default or a crutch? I don't think you've ever felt like that in your life, have you? I mean, I like when I'm in trouble. All right. So, so when you're not inspired, what do you do? I'm actually, in my experience, when I feel slightly bored mm -hmm. working on a painting for so long time, it's the best moment. Because I'm so bored, I want to kill it. And there is a chance, uh, thanks to that feeling, I can be very brave. So well, I've seen that tonight when you melt the eyes out. Yeah, may maybe. I mean, I, I like to, I, when I really feel like there is nothing to lose, that's a very good moment. Wow. All right. Sophia, do you, same question, though. Um, how do you respond? To, well, you haven't been painting long enough to have this, but do you, do, <laughs> sorry. Do you have, That's true. Alyssa, anybody, um, do you feel that you're falling into things that you rely on and they're crutches? and realized how dangerous that is. It really sucks the curiosity out of the whole process. So within the last five years, I've made it absolutely mandatory that I do get lost, you know? Wow. Yeah. That's why I don't do anything the same way two times in a row. I try not to. Yeah, I, would, I would agree that there is a, a moment that I can almost feel when something becomes a little bit too systematic or, or a little bit too uh, wrote and so at that moment I'll, I'll, I'll remind myself to sort of take risks and sometimes I'll even do some smaller studies uh, to just sort of try out some new new ways of putting down paint. So you sort of basically tie one hand behind your back to create a problem. <laughs> right, right, basically. Thanks. I have a question that's specific to Menu also. Mm -hmm. You have d done many portrait commissions. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the issue of complaining uh, patrons, like if they're not happy with the result, if they, <laughs> right, right, the right. nose is too big, the eyes are too s small, sure, whatever. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I mean, usually uh, what I'll do is I'll ask them to sort of live with the painting for for about a week, and I'll and I'll say, you know, let, let's meet again in in about a week. And I think that's the challenge with commissioned work, and and why uh, about ten years ago I started to move more towards my own work is that in that situation it really is a shared process where at the end of the day they, the client has to be pleased. Right. So, uh, so there, are, there are moments when, when that can feel uh, uh, limiting. It, it can also feel incredibly gratifying when, when they feel that you've, you know, you've really offered them and something it, about a loved one. Or but do they frequently come around after that week and realize that you've been honest? I've had both experiences. I've had one, you know, uh, I've had the majority of them will say, you know what, this is the, you're, you're right. I went back and I looked at pictures, or if, if it's posthumous, or, or they'll, they'll observe their, the person that they know a little bit more closely, and they'll be like, I never noticed that. And then 
there were there was one time there are a few of them you know you can never hit it out of the park all the time where they were just like you know I still don't like it and then you have to to try to work with them it's also funny sometimes you can have a situation where their mate or their children may think that the portrait is dead on and they, yes. they don't yeah yeah I had one in one situation in particular where it was judged by committee 30 family members came oh, in and, uh, and and they let the kids decide whether whether it was you know mom that's the way yeah. you really look right yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Bernardo there's also a question for you from yeah. Facebook um, just to talk you're going to be teaching a master class that addresses texture and paint can you talk a little bit about that class, how it's structured, and what you hope students would get from it? Uh, the most, in my opinion, in this little experience of teaching here at the academy, what I realized that the typical mistake of a, of a beginner is that they get tight, super tight, all the time. They tend to use very small brushes. They tend to follow certain patterns and repeating on and on and on. So I asked them to break through by changing approach changing brushes very big because that forced them to feel very uncomfortable and wild and so finally they are not allowed to be timid mm -hmm. because the brush is big and there is a lot of chunk on co of colors so they lost they lose control and thank to this losing control and maybe making ugly paintings at the beginning but that helps help them to really break timidity so they also used just thicker paint, you know, like thicker, thicker paint, thicker impasto, thicker brushes, and trying to be quick and embrace mistakes. What, is, what it matters to me is the way you start a painting. The beginning is very important. So I'm trying to teach them how to start in a loose way. So this is just sort of a follow-up question, but what are your favorite shaped brushes? Like what scale brush is sort of your ideal? No, ideal? For, for myself, yeah. no, I use the old range. I actually use very thin brushes and very thick. It depends on what, what, what's going on. Do you use brights? Do you use filberts? Do you use rounds? All of them. All of them. Uh, I, for sure, when I start, I tend to use bigger brushes because I need to cover a bigger area. And then eventually, slowly, step by step, since I start from the general masses, I will use smaller brushes for more details. Can I get a um, camera shot on Sophia's uh, painting right now? Because she's come to a point where she's saying to herself, this is done now. And I'm going to start another one. Will you talk to us about that, Sophia? Uh, sure. Um, from my experience so far of painting, especially painting from life, it's a lot about thinking of it like a chess game or a tennis match or something like that. And uh, there's a moment where you're, I'm kind of realizing, well, I have to just accept that I'm not sure what to do next. And the taking a risk and possibly destroying what I have is worth more than keeping where it's at. And so not to, kind of what I'm going to do when we get Grimaldi back up here. I'm probably going to take charcoal to it and draw a little bit and just let it be. I think that's enough. I'll probably just do another one and uh, have fun. You're going to draw on the wet paint with charcoal? Yeah. <laughs> and that's to do what? I'm not happy with the drawing and I think I, think, uh, I could settle some arguments with it. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. So in that sense, you're saying you're finished with this, but it's not finished. Yeah, it's done point. with me. It's I done know. with you. At this <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, that's great because we'll get to see you start another one. Yeah. Um, um, which will be interesting to see. Are you going to do Michael again? Or are you going to do Dan? Depends. I have to take a look. I think I think probably. Uh, go back into Michael now that I have a good understanding of the light and the colors. Yeah. I could probably be more bold and more ridiculous in the beginning. Kind of let go a little bit more. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying you're stopping when you're not sure what else to do, like when you feel like you've reached the end of your knowledge on that yeah. piece. Yeah, and I'm kind of weighing whether it's worth it to possibly ruin what's there or keep where it is and just walk away. Yeah. And that you might walk away for a while and then return to it as you got more thoughts on it later. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
Well, it's a great looking piece of work just as it is. Thank you. Thanks. It is, David, but speaking to your point, I know Sophia, I had her as a student. I would see a painting like that, love it, go get a cup of coffee and come back and it was totally different. So Sophia cannot be trusted. <laughs> this is a finished painting, but it is a wonderful painting and it's wonderful the way you've used the background to work with the image itself. I'm really interested in the, um, the green almost outline on the left hand side of that. And I was, well, the whole time you were painting, I was wondering if you were going to knock that back or keep that. And I think it, it adds a real vibrancy. Will you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I really love color. And I like starting out a little bit bolder than maybe I should. Is that a phthalo? Uh, yeah, phthalo green. <laughs> but um, That's unforgiving. I, I really believe that all the colors are everywhere you look. Like, you can find all, any color you want if you really want to see it. You'll see it. So starting bolder and then kind of honing in kind of gives me more possibilities to build color complexity and leaving this bit, it kind of speaks to the green all throughout and, and it kind of complements this pink orange that's coming back across for me. That's what I'm excited about with the color. I will say this, Sophia, if we were in class, I would say exactly what David's speaking to. The green on the, on the left, I would smudge it a little bit below the cheekbone mm -hmm. so that it starts to move back in space because yeah. space is your job. Yeah. And you're basically, the cheekbone on the left is coming at us more closely than the one on the right. And yeah. our job is spatial and that side of the face should come closer to us. But I know. Thank you. No, no I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa, um, same question about brushes. Do you use a full range of Filbert's, Bright's, Rounds, or is there a particular shape that All you love? All of them, but Filbert. I don't like Filbert. <laughs> oh, it's my favorite brush. I know. Yeah. We have to disagree on that. But I, I like starting with big, big flat ones, and then um, smaller round ones, and then big round ones, and then I get to like small flat ones. It's usually is kind of weird, but yeah. that's how it, how it goes with me. Flats and Bright's, both long and short. Um, brights, you know, they kind of become brights because they're so down. aged, you know, and the, the buildup just keeps happening. But I find like the big, and they have to be bristle to start. That's really key because that holds more paint. Um, the real soft brushes I find are too flimsy to hold a lot of paint, so those will be at the end uh, for detail. I've got a question coming in through Facebook uh, from Betty, and that is thoughts on water-soluble oils versus traditional oils. Um, I'm a bit of a purist. I can completely understand because of tox toxicity why uh, uh, someone would use them. And, 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 and they actually work fairly well, but I, I have found that with certain um, mixtures, they tend to, um, there's just a, a different feel that one has to get used to. So, uh, so, and I guess one positive about them is they can be mixed, I hear, with both oil and with, with water. So I would sort of opt to use it with linseed oil, you know, yeah. if, I, if I had to use them. Alyssa, in all your paintings of water, mm. have you ever <laughs> There is that? no water in yeah. my paintings of water. <laughs> ever... um, I really don't like the water-soluble stuff. I like the body of oil paint so much. Um, and, and, and as far as toxicity, you know, if you're just using linseed oil or, or um, and avoiding mineral spirits or turpentine, you're, you're, it's, it's okay. You know, just stay away from cadmiums. Even lead, if you don't eat it, <laughs> you're going to be okay. You know, as long as you're not inhaling the dust. If you sand lead, that's not good. But um, I don't, it's not as dangerous as it seems. And to be honest, the acrylic paints have these mediums that are pretty toxic too. So I think you have to really get to know the materials and be mindful. But I don't want to sacrifice anything for the, the, that juiciness of the paint. That's yeah. why I got in this game, is the yeah. paint. So, yeah. Sophia, have you ever used water-soluble oils? No. I, I painted in watercolor. I don't know if it's a similar thing. I don't know anything about it. Um, but I was doing a master class with Alex Konevsky, like, last month. And he said, you know, watercolor gets a bad rap because people associate it with, like, maybe older ladies out in the sun with an umbrella and they're, they're painting in watercolor. But it's really, because it's water soluble, it's the most brutal of all of the mediums because it dries instantly. So I don't know, that's, if that speaks to the question, yeah. that's my answer. 
I always think it's so funny that watercolor is frequently the first medium people try, and it is absolutely, it's as hard as fresco. It's ridiculous. I find it terrifying. Whereas opposed to oils, you just can't make a mistake because you can always adjust, layer, cover, move on. Manu, I noticed that you're introducing some color into your background. Tell us about that. Yeah. I, you know, I think that I just compositionally felt that I needed something going a little bit more vertically and and just to sort of lend some vitality to the painting. Some of that ends up being a little bit more instinctual, you know. I feel like I'm seeing, I'm sure this is not visible on the camera, but I feel like I'm seeing a relationship between what you're adding and the colors in I think that's Danica Lundy's painting back there. Mm -hmm. Are you being influenced by that at all? Um, you know, I'm noticing some of the colors that are moving back there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've also had a question asking people to talk about how they prep their canvases before they start. Mm -hmm. Bernardo, will you talk about that? I work on pre-primed canvases done by People, they do that better than me. I want to focus on the way I paint. And I choose a couple of type of canvases. I'm buying all the time from a little shop in, in, in Brooklyn. And then I stain the canvas simply with some turp. With a simple tone like this one tonight. And then a couple of days after, I start attacking the canvas as, as strong as possible to activate the canvas, the, the, the painting, with a lot of uh, texture and a lot of colors. Thank you. A question is coming about master copying to all of you. Bernardo, have you ever done a master copy? No. I didn't think so. Um, Sophia, have you? Yeah, um, I've done a couple of them for class. I think they're really insightful. I actually just did one with uh, Dan Thompson's drawing one class. The whole class did them. We compared their drawing to the original. Everybody had their pieces up on the wall. And I felt like there's something really incredible about studying the line work, or even especially hatch work, of a ma an old master. because. When you're doing it, you think you understand the language, but you don't. <laughs> By the time you're finished with it, you're usually more confused and overwhelmed than you were when you started. I think that's good. I think that's the result of you know, a master's intellect kind of washing over your own, and I think that's healthy. That's a very good answer. I know, I've, I know filmmakers do that. They look at a film they really love, they recast it themselves, they do all the lighting, they shoot it exactly the same. In order to understand it, they walk in a master's shoes. What about you, Alyssa? Have you done any master copies? Somehow managed to get through without doing that. Um, yeah, no, I've never gone to a museum and sat there and copied a painting. I think it's a great exercise. And when I was in school, my classmates did it and they, it helped them so tremendously. Never got to do it. I did it when I was at school here in a class being taught by Ted Schmidt and I found it one of the most valuable things and I learned so much from trying to understand what was in that painting. Manu, have you done it? Um, I have. I have done quite a bit of it. Um, the opportunity first came to me about uh, 20 years ago with uh, John Frederick Murray who was a, a very generous and intelligent uh, artist and teacher. And, uh, and at the academy here, I think it's one of the longest running uh, opportunities for, for students to go to the Met with, with TED. And, uh, and it's actually come to the continuing studies program as well too, which is just remarkable with Johnny Brandau. So um, it was a, a really invaluable experience for me. Mm -hmm. I had a really interesting twist on it in my first mm -hmm. semester here. John Jacobs Meyer had a class where we were asked to come in and do a master copy from memory in mm -hmm. one um, mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. So you had to just come in and remember what you could of it and paint right. it. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow. it was God, fascinating. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. But that's very impressive. Yeah. I remember yeah. one year where mm -hmm. I did nothing but copies of the Sistine Chapel for the entire year. 
And I learned <laughs> so much from doing that. Mm. I was just doing wow. it over and over and over again. Mm. What I find fascinating about that, Peter, is that you were one of the most accomplished artists I've ever known. And it's extremely modern work. And yet when you say that, I can feel the, the solidity of Michelangelo in that. Yeah, it's very important. Alyssa, what are you thinking about now as you're working on this painting? It's time to make choices. Time to make choices. Yeah. Because you can't, you can't do everything you want to do in two and a half hours. What are the choices presenting themselves? Um, I want to restate the light um, and commit to the, the light that's here and just restate the color relationships that now that I understand them after searching through them, choose. I think this, process, this thing that you just said, restatement, is such an important point in a painting. How did, how, did, how did you get to that point? When did you start feeling that way, Alyssa, in, in this painting? Um, just recently, like in the last five seconds. I mean, the thoughts change that fast. Like you, you have so many thoughts when you're painting. You're kind of just in the moment. So now my thought is I want to work on the eye. <laughs> it's just it's like frenetic speed painting. So I'm going to try to do as much as I can to get this, um, to feel some, some sense of consistency overall. Because uh, it is easy to go myopically into one detail and try to resolve yeah. it. And I want to check in with everybody here. I, I Manu, mean, what are you thinking about right now at this point? Um, I'm thinking about how to uh, be mindful of, of um, building up the, the whole composition as well as, as taking care of, of the relationships between different aspects of the, of the uh, painting. So at this point, you're starting to think about the composition overall. Yeah, just keep checking in with the composition overall, as well as sort of move towards towards uh, what what's next. How to how to how to sort of wrap it up. Yeah. Bernardo, what are you thinking about? Huh? Sorry, I didn't I didn't I didn't. I didn't. Are you thinking, Bernardo? I'm just focused on the painting. So can you repeat the question, please? I just I wanted to check in with you and say what um, are you thinking about in this painting at this moment? What are you What's it asking you to do? Um, I'm trying to. Understand. Okay, for a frontal portrait, what it matters to me at the beginning is to understand the relationship between nose, eyes, cheekbones, mouth, this, this thing. So more than thinking of the overall painting right now, I'm trying to understand the relationship in the structure between the nose, the eyes, and the mouth. Okay, so you're still really focused on the structure yeah, of that I, form. Yeah, not only, also to understand how to get in, in 3D, how to get the, how to stick out from the, cam, the canvas, the nose, going out of it. Yeah. And I wish I can say something about, uh, I mean, uh, the, I, yes, I don't do, I never did copies of, of paintings from the past, but I really go and look at paintings from the past constantly. I don't feel like to make a, a drawing from it or a, a painting from it, but I need to see them. I need to study. I study them so carefully all my life, especially, I mean, starting from Renaissance going to, yeah, the 20th century. Some of, of course, I choose my favorite ones. Talk to us about the story that, where you saw the hatch marks when they pulled the ceiling down, where you talked to us about before, where you saw that Basically, it was a very large ceiling that was being restored and uh, it was brought down. Cor Correggio. Yeah, please. Yeah, I was like, I was young and I was with my father and a, and a restorator of, in Parma, in a small town in Italy, where this outstanding painter, his name is Correggio, was working during the period of Raffaello, Leonardo, uh, and Tiziano. But he was developing a technique uh, uh, moving toward from Tiziano, but changing really strongly, especially on fresco technique. Basically, he is, uh, if you look at his, his frescoes from close up, the way I did it, because I was so uh, lucky to get nearby the, the ceiling, and he's almost a divisionist. He's painting, com keeping colors very pure, but in an opposite warm and cool, mm -hmm. and also opposite strokes and direction that makes you feel from far that everything is so smooth. He, he was able to paint the atmosphere. 
And uh, the, the way he was doing that was really almost like a divisionist. Okay, I'm really interested right now in what Sophia is doing because she's started making a, a new start. She started, I don't know if this was visible on camera, but she did a very expressive charcoal drawing first and then is obliterating it with a huge brush. Talk to us, Sophia. I'm just making a mess right now. Um, I'm trying, I think I wanted to go in with the charcoal so that I'd kind of lose this preciousness with the surface because it's stark white. But maybe if I let go a little bit by drawing, I can paint with a little bit more uh, attitude. Did you start the first one with charcoal? Um, I, I played around with it, but no. I, I kind of used the fact that I had the, the background had a lot of interesting marks on it already. There's a question from uh, Penny on Facebook about underpainting. I know quite a few of you will work with monotones first, but do you prefer working in oil or in charcoal if you're doing an underpainting? Oh, yeah. Well, you use quite a bit of rub outs, right? Um, I teach that, but I usually don't start that way. I kind of just put a ground and start in with color. Yeah. Lenny, do you prefer work, working with a fully developed monotone? No, actually, sometimes it, it really ends up being a little bit more of a loose beginning. And uh, I found that over the years, I more and more like to, to, to build up straight away with, with color, yeah. Okay, here's a question that's come in through Facebook and it's addressed to everybody, um, including the moderators. What's your favorite section at the Met? Wow. At that vast treasure trove, the Met. This is so obvious, but Dutch 17th century for me, it's so strong and it's one of the deepest part of the collection. Margaret? I mean, of course. I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, the, the best things that the Met, one of the great things about Met as a teaching um, institution is it has a lot of bad paintings in it. Mm -hmm. So you can see somebody who's done a really wonderful job and then somebody who's really blown it right next to it. So it's very easy to teach. But I was just teaching there last week and found the contemporary section to be the most illuminating part of the Met for me. Susan Rothenberg was there opposite. Somebody had hung it beautifully. And there was a Susan Rothenberg talking in those in a way that she just worked with pink to move it, and then it went into a Lucian Freud, and it was, and then there was a, an Uslan Kiefer on the far wall where the poppies were in pink. It was a heck of a moment. Yeah. I also love the 16th century steaming section. It's just so beautiful, and each one of them is so wildly different from each other. Yeah. Bernardo, what's your favorite section at the Met? Rembrandt. Rembrandt? Yeah, there is an outstanding collection of Rembrandt at the Metropolitan Museum. Sophia? I like the modern section, and I like going through it with Margaret. She's really great at explaining everything, talking through it. Alyssa? Well, it changes for me, but um, I think right now the modern, you know, more modern stuff. Sitting in front of Jackson Pollock's Autumn Rhythm, just, I just want to cry. It's great. Manu? Uh, for me, it's sort of a tie between the European uh, sort of 1700s, 1800s, and as well as the American wing. I really enjoy the American wing as well. Yeah. What I love about the Met is, though, it's, it's also like a time machine. You can go anywhere in the world at any time in history and see, like, phenomenal examples of what the culture produced. So being in the Islamic minister section is as important as being in the arms and armor section is as important as going to the jewelry collection. I mean, it's just, it's just endless. You can go anywhere. I agree with you. I think it's the reason you pay the rent to live here. I mean, I literally taught myself to paint as far as I can from going to the Met. So there was a question from Jay uh, on Facebook. David Kassan says that the portrait is all about the eyes. Do you agree? artist painting right now? Not really. I, I think it truly varies. You know, it, it, it really can be, uh, while most portraits certainly are gravitate towards the eyes, I think, you know, certainly Rembrandt made, made portraits that had, uh, you know, a lot of mystery to the, 
to the eyes, they were probably the least painted part of it. So I think it just really depends on on the intention. Yeah. Anybody else? What? It's all about the eyes, or or not? <laughs> it's about, in my opinion, the relationship between. Uh, first of all, there are colors, there are stains. So, how do you place those stains in order to make them feel like they are yeah. eyes? Transparent. Yeah. yeah. And how do you place those eyes nearby the volumes of our nose and cheekbones and etc.? Everything matters, in my opinion. Have any of you tried to do a portrait by doing a caricature first? And almost get an idea of what the person's most extreme uh, characteristics are and then go back into the portrait? I've, I've never actually, I've, I've wanted to try that. I've sort of, I've, I've, I've always thought that it would be a really wonderful thing to do. I recently was at the Morgan Library uh, for the great, uh, Drawn to Greatness uh, exhibit and noticed that I think it was Tiepolo, who I never realized had done all these fantastic caricatures. Mm -hmm. So it's something I'd really like to try. I haven't quite done that, but I think it'd be a great practice to do that. I've got a process question here that's coming from Richard on Facebook. Um, can you, this is addressed to all the artists, can you just uh, discuss mark making? Alyssa. Oh, I love that part. Uh, mark making is, I think, the, the, I don't know, the cream on the top. So I, I try to make the marks be as different as they can from each other, using different brushes, different pressures, different amounts of paints. Um, I think the paintings that I like the most are are paintings you can't figure out how they were done. So if you can make your mark making unpredictable, uh, you can't really keep ahead of the process. So I think that's interesting. So unpredictability in mark making. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Sophia? Well, we were talking in class, Bernard and I were talking in a class about mark making language and we, we ended up drawing our, our signatures on a blackboard. And we were saying how the calligraphy of your hand, that is, that is the most raw of your, of your mark making language. That's, it's not, it's so, it's clean. You can see it clearly in your own name. And the way you paint reflects that. The way you make marks reflects that. And, and anything that takes you away from that, um, Maybe don't trust it. That's fascinating. I have never heard that before. Yeah. Wow. Bernardo, mark making thoughts. Paintings are done by mark makings. The way you mark the area. So is 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 everything. Is tracks and smell. So what do you, what what's more important than that, in my opinion? Just little things. This is the, this is it. Even if your mark makings are very smooth. And apparently you don't see them. You don't see those strokes, but they are there. They are inside. And they are building the image and the strength of the painting. So is, what, what is about, what, 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 what are mark makings? Is basically making paintings. And you're not thinking of them individually. It's just what happened. Yes. I have a Facebook question. Um, <clears throat> when you're working on a painting in your studio, are you always thinking in terms of series, or are you approaching them one at a time? Um, it depends. It's, it's, I go with the flow. Sometimes I need to start many paintings. Sometimes I, I get stuck on one. It's hard to tell. Yeah. God, so it's you very comforting. Work in series, don't you? It's very comforting. Uh, <laughs> Bernardo, I, you know, sometimes it's series, and they bounce off each other and they inform each other. Um, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you just get into one thing and you work on that until it's done. So I, I, I do think it's it's dependent on how the what the vibe is in the studio and what the needs are and what you know. I mean, sometimes we have to work on something we don't necessarily choose. I think you have to trust the moments where, like sometimes paintings are a series and you don't know it yet. They're diverged. And then after you keep painting them, they start to converge at another level in a way that kind of maybe enlightens you of your own, what you're saying altogether. 
And I think maybe that's when things become as serious for me. But. I have a question from Facebook from, from Nancy. She wants all of the artists, Ms. Bernardo, uh, do you practice visual memory drawing, looking at a subject for a few minutes, then drawing from memory? Mm -hmm. um, for, I can start by answering that. I, w I would say that um, I, I've started to draw more and more just from pure imagination uh, and, and in the past have sort of given myself that task to, to get a little bit more versed. I think there's so much freedom that comes from uh, understanding the human form well enough, you know, planes and, and anatomy and so on that you can then invent what, what you want. And I think that's what the academy does so well in its curriculum to, to help its students develop. So, um, so yeah, yeah. Is that in the service of, so that when you look at the image, the human being again, for example, mm -hmm. you look more closely or, or is it mm -hmm. in the service of doing a more distorted, more imaginative painting after? I think it's both, really. Okay. I, th I think it's really both. I think it, you know, primarily it's just the freedom where you can, you know, invent, invent and play. Mm -hmm. Alyssa, when you look at a model, how do you visually sort the elements into an overall composition? I don't know. I guess I start with the gaze. And then you said earlier, what, what's the, it, is the eyes? Are the eyes the most important part of the portrait? And I think. They can be, and oftentimes they are, but for me it's the gaze and setting that up to be, everything works around that. And organizing, you know, the tilt of the head and the gesture of the face and the way the eyebrows are moving because that's going to give you the expression, um, the direction of the mouth. And, and like, I, I try to go for the specificity of, of the weirdness of things too to get, um, to get at that psychology. So I set it up that way, and then it's so much of it's just intuitive. Um, you know, as you go, you find out what what is important as well. What about you, Sophia? How do you visually sort the elements when you look at a model? I look at a model. Yeah, I would say the oh the, the quietness of intuition. You know, really listening to the image because there's a, your initial reaction, and then creating a, your first marks are creating the context, you know, like the architecture, the rest of the painting or, or the drawing. So I think it's all about having a conversation with yourself and just being in tune with what that means, whatever it, form it takes, just letting it shift you. Manu, do you have a, a hierarchy for how you sort it in your front that stays with you or? Can you repeat the question? I was all no, no, sure. When you look at a model, how do you visually sort the elements? Is it the same mm. for you each time? Is there a hierarchy that you work your way through? I think um, it really starts with the design of, of the picture. I'll sort of think of the tonal range and the, the context of the shapes uh, next to each other that I'm looking at. Uh, so I sort of think of different levels, uh, one level being those shapes, a second being sort of some linear rhythms that I might find in it. How much time a day do you spend in the studio? Myself personally. I, I try to spend as much time as I can. I, uh, when I'm preparing for a show, it might be as much as, you know, it could be you know, for about 40 hours, you know, uh, in there as many days as I can. But it can really vary, comes in waves with sort of trying to balance it with responsibilities of, te you know, teaching, commitment to teaching, commitment to family. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Alyssa? How much time in the studio uh, average? You know, day? I try to set up my schedule so I have three or four day blocks of painting and then and nothing else. So no appointments, no meetings, nothing. And in those three or four days, I work as long as I can stand. So that could be 14 and 15 hours, which is very satisfying. And then then when if, I have, if somebody sets up a meeting, then I put all my appointments on that day. <laughs> so then I don't, because I need to get into the flow and then and then just, you know, put cones around that day. Michael, how much time do you spend in the studio on a daily basis? How, how much time do you spend in the studio on a daily basis? As much as possible. Uh, I have a daughter, so I'm kind of, you know, changes the, the hours, but usually about seven hours a day, I'd say, the days that I'm not here. Um, Dan, can I ask you that question? 
I think it's the same answer as everybody else, but I think it's important to point out that it's quality time and the way that you engage is really key, more so than the quantity, in my opinion. So, yeah. Thanks. Don't you prioritize when you go into a painting, when your energy is highest, you do the hardest stuff, and then you leave things that you know I put on Miles Davis for towards the end, that you can, that you're, that you're just basically firming up forms. Yes, you. I mean, it, everything has a pulse to it, you know, a cadence to, to the work. And sometimes there's a really hyper intense time where you have to be furious and decisive. And then other times where there's a lot of the patients involved in kind of working through things. There's uh, the kind of inquisitive stage where you're working on compositional elements, doubting the work. And then other points where you have to be very much, okay, I believe in this. Am I going to see this pull through? You do that, then it fails, then you work it out, hopefully. But that first leap into the studio in the morning, you take that first jump, leap of faith, first thing, first step, right? Yeah, walk in and start working on compositional studies usually, like really ideas that I've had over the night, uh, things from sketchbooks, things like that. I'll throw them out on the table there, look at them, kind of ponder how that might work with them. Sam, um, I'm trying to, I'm kind of driven by the, it's like the cyclical process of the piece. It's, it's got like this intangible magnetism that pulls me in and I try to get my blood up to the moment that I think is the possible or possibly impossible moment. So I'll build the foundation and then get my, my nerve up, go for it. If it falls apart, hopefully there's enough time and enough opportunity to, to uh, you know, recover and uh, resurrect what was there before, so. The, both of you, that was said very, both of you like guerrilla soldiers, and I think that's rather accurate. Thank you. I've been asked to describe the summer undergraduate residency program for Vera <coughs> from Facebook. This is actually a program that we run every summer. Uh, it's a month-long program where there's deep instruction in anatomy, drawing, painting, sculpture, four days a week. <coughs> You get a, uh, a studio at the academy, uh, a dormitory room at NYU, um, and basically, you know, a real exposure to New York City uh, as, a, as a font of inspiration. Um, but you also are studying with uh, academy graduates. You're studying with people that have been through the program, that know it well. <clears throat> and it's just a, a great kind of introduction to the school. Actually, is anybody in the audience? Would, did anybody experience the summer undergraduate residency program? Yeah, there you go. Um, every so often, they become MFA students within a year or two. Sure. I have a question from Liz from Facebook that's, all right, it says on average, how many different brushes do you use to complete a painting? To anybody, any of the artists. All of them. Not keeping track of it, though. I'm looking at Bruno's got about 115. <laughs> all right. What, um, all right, let's see. I think. Yeah. I think the answer to that question is all about um, cleanliness, you know, keeping your, keeping your brushes clean is, I think, key. And so having a lot of them means that you can have a lot of mud and you'll still be able to make sense out of it. Um, and then also, also stroke, like the kind of brush that you have affects the way the paint comes off, off the brush. It affects how the paint lays. It affects how it reads on the surface. So trying not to get stuck in the habit of repeating a similar brush over and over and over again, you want to try to switch it up. That's, so I, I like to have different kinds of brushes, different kinds of applicators. That's a great answer, Sabina. Also, let me ask you this. In terms of keeping things clean, do you like, you take your, the rag in your left hand between strokes, and looking at the brushes that you've got, only three on there. Do you wipe off the paint under that brush, under that rag, and keep it clean from one application to the next? Occasionally, usually, I think you have to be careful because if you don't, if I don't um, wipe it, that means that whatever's on the brush, I have to incorporate into the color I'm going to use next, or I have to incorporate it into the value that's on the canvas already. So you have to do a lot of mental adding. So 
the more colors and confusions already on the brush, already on the palette, you have to kind of take steps ahead to kind of guess what's going to happen to the paint when you add fresh paint to that. Um, so keeping it clean again, I think, um, is healthier. It's easier to see what's going on. Wiping is good. I love you saying that considering that you really work without a net. I mean, there's, there's, you have three brushes there that are in pools of various kinds of paint. One's darkish, one's mid-tone, and one's light. That's what I would say. But you're also depending on the surprise of what's on that brush when you hit the canvas, correct? Right, right. So I just grabbed something off my brush. It's too green and too bright. But I trust that I can bring it back. There's something, something exciting about that. So we have a very broad question here. Um, I feel like I'm going to get ridiculed for this, but do you consider yourself a Florentine or a Venetian by nature? Are you structural or atmospheric? Ask him. Oh, I am going with Bernardo. <laughs> Bernardo first. No, it's a very complicated answer. Question. The answer is going to be long. So I think everybody's kind of both when they are good. Because you need to have uh, the skill of a draftman in one side, but also they have the pictorial feeling in the other. So the Venetians are more painterly, right. while the, the Florentines are more draft ones. Yeah. Anybody else want to bite? I think that's such an interesting question. I also agree that I think it's good to have both skills, both ways of seeing the picture in terms of like what, what does pictorial mean? I think that means atmosphere. I think drawing means Drawing, drawing kind of cascades into both, but there's a specificity in drawing, drawing and, and feeling your line, letting it dictate the painting inside of it, that I think is also an important skill to have. And letting them kind of crisscross over can help you uh, figure out the problems that you're at hand with. Oops. I had a question come in. Um, that was actually directed to me, which is, are there ever older artists at the Academy? I wonder why they're asking me. Um, and, and can you start later in life? And this is coming from Sharon from Facebook. I just want to say that the Academy is comprised of an incredibly diverse and wonderful community. And there are people of all ages and all backgrounds and all types. And I did come to the Academy when I was in my late 40s. And I um, loved it. And I felt that there was almost no age difference because we were all there focusing on the same thing and it was a great equalizer and everybody in the community was so passionate about the, the striving to learn and the striving to gather knowledge from each other that it was a very level playing field. I was incredibly jealous sometimes of the younger people knowing that they had 30 more years to go on this than I would have. But um, the first years that I taught here, <coughs> I had a Norwegian artist who is 74 years old, had basically had a real estate business his entire life and said the two years he spent at the academy were the two best years of his life. I, think I also get women who've raised their children. And that was their, women lead somebody, it wasn't me, it was a good novelist, said women lead sequential lives. And I find when I get to, when I have a student who's a woman whose her children are in college or they're launched, that woman is spending 40 to 50 hours in the studio a week with great joy. Absolutely. Okay, here's another question uh, coming in through Facebook. Trevor is asking, do you approach long paintings differently than ones you know must be done in two and a half hours? Perfect question for tonight. Yeah, Manu. Yes. Um, I think there, there is a, a, a different approach in the sense that in my own studio work, I, if, if I know that I'm going to have a certain amount of time, I like to do a little bit of, of more planning. So I'm someone who certainly does, um, you know, thumbnails and then move on to, you know, sometimes even value studies, certainly color studies. So I think in that sense, it would, it would be different, a different approach. But then when I get to the final canvas, it's, it's probably a very similar, very similar approach. How about you, Bernardo? Would you, you approach a canvas or a painting differently if you know it's going to have only a short time to I mean, work on it? Yes, and of course, actually, I don't think it's, in my, for me, it's, it's impossible to make a painting this scale in two hours. 
what I can show is the way I can start a painting and the way I start the first steps of mapping the area. Um, to finish a painting, you need, it's like playing, being a professional chess player. When you are a very good chess player, you do the first, the second, the third move, knowing what's going to happen in the following 50 moves. Uh, that maybe over there seems like you are uh, sacrificing a piece uh, and you, the people can think you are making a mistake, but it's actually made there for a purpose that is going to be clear and evident in few steps further. Uh, so that's the way I paint. So in two hours, what can I do? I just do a beginning. Alyssa, could you address that? Oh, for sure. Um, yes, the, there's a very big difference depending on how much time you have. Plus, I mean, you're working from life. You have to consider the model's comfort. And um, I guess you don't have to, but I, I do. And, um, you know, how much time they're going to be willing to give you. So you have to, you know, economize your your um, efforts and strokes and decisions into what you can possibly get done. So there's more of a pressure to plan, which can be really great. Um, so something like this takes some strategizing. Whereas if I have all the time in the world, I can, I can purposefully obliterate things and lose my way so that I can find my way back, which is part of my, my practice in the studio. I wouldn't do that here in two and a half hours. <laughs> So uh, I have an announcement to make. We are at our 30 minute mark. We have only 30 minutes left. We have people watching in Zimbabwe, Australia, Miami, California, and more. So if there are any questions out there in Facebook land, please don't hesitate to share them with us. I have one from Penny on Facebook. Is life as an artist self-indulgent? Not if you are independently wealthy. <laughs> right, right. I would say not, not really. I think that um, having to balance, I mean, well, there certainly is, it's a, it's a choice that, uh, that, that is certainly not like be choosing something a little bit more traditional. Um, in my own life, again, balancing being a parent and, and, and other responsibilities, I certainly don't feel very selfish most of the time. So I think that uh, in, in a week's time, you know, being able to find those moments when it's, when it's all yours, I think everybody sort of needs that, you know, regardless of One of the things I think is never talked about, there, there, mm. there was a famous artist who said, I never made a sacrifice, my family did mm. for me to be an artist. It has to do with where the money's coming from. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I talk about in class is do not berate yourself for not doing the same amount of work someone's doing. Look for the money. Where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. And the self-indulgence is, are you taking that from someone else? Or do you have it yourself? Mm -hmm. Being an artist is a very hard life. But it's complicated when it becomes part of a family's economic path. What about you, Sophia, as a young person? Is it so self-indulgent? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I think we were talking about this in, the, in art and culture with some people, and this idea of, of risk and what that means to you, how that comes into the play. How much risk are you taking is definitely a factor on whether it's self-indulgent or not. So I'll just leave it there. What was the last thing you said? I'll just leave it there. Okay. Yeah. Um, Bernardo, self-indulgent, being an artist? In that, artist is a very tough life. So you need to be brave. And you need to really love it. Otherwise, there is no need to struggle so much. I remember sitting across the table from a very wealthy man who was sort of chiding me a little bit about this and saying, I'd like to be an artist, sit in front of painting and just paint all day. That sounds like fun. Mm. <clears throat> I said, try making meaning out of nothing. That's really the point of the whole thing. You, it's truly alchemical situation. You're bringing something to the world that it's never seen before. Try to do that and have it actually be valuable to the world. I mean, it's one of the toughest jobs that I could ever imagine. Yeah, and then try and do it over and over and over again every day. Over and over and over again for 
decades. I would agree with that. I would just, um, I want to ask the two models, because those of you have found this. What do you think being an artist is self-indulgent? Uh, it's obviously very self-directed, but, you know, it's a, it's a job where you have ultimate accountability for everything, and, and I think not many people have the luxury or the, we don't have the luxury of having uh, our world dictated to us. The parameters that we set aren't um, created by external features. They're created by ourselves. And so I think that that's a, a really, really, I, I think self-indulgent is a very strange word for it. But. Everything that Peter just said, try doing the opposite. It's harder for us to try doing the opposite than what he was just talking about because we're compelled to do this. I would agree with that. I once had a doctor say to me, a shrink, say to me, look, most people work very hard to get an education, to learn a skill that they repeat every single day, and they have people around them that are constantly their workmates or telling them they're doing a good job. An artist gets up every day and reinvents themselves. And he said, it's a terrible job and it's very difficult. And so when you, you're you seeing a psychiatrist over it, don't feel so bad. Okay. So Alyssa, did you have a point on that earlier? To be able to do this for a living. I feel, I mean, I, I just do, I don't know. I, I, it is hard and I've made a lot of sacrifices, but I don't carry that. You know, I, I think I'm generally I'm pretty lucky and I'm grateful for this. It's a privilege to do it. You know? yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a privilege and it's a tough privilege. Yeah, and it's a responsibility time. and you have to be self-motivated. I mean, I could go on about the, the struggle, but I don't think about that. I, I think I'm so glad I get to do this. What, you know, what if I don't get to do this in five years? You know, I want to enjoy it. I, I wanted to ask, I've, I, we've still got questions coming in from Facebook all over the world. But as we've got less than a half hour to go, are there any questions from the people who are in this room right now watching these people paint? Anyone in the audience? Okay, I'm gonna go back to Facebook here. Um, you know, I've got somebody uh, named Carrie who is asking, have you ever experienced painter's block? <laughs> I can answer that one. Yeah. Please do. Um, yes. No, um, yeah, I, I really did. Um, about five, year, five years ago, um, I went through a, a life-changing loss that erased the meaningfulness of painting for me. And so it wasn't even a block. It was like, I don't even want to do this anymore. You know, this, is, this isn't giving me what I was hoping for. This was supposed to, you know, be the thing that would always never fail me or whatever, but it wasn't. And so it was, it felt like more than a block. I almost felt resentful about how painting was failing me and I had to recreate the meaning um, by, you know, actually getting lost, literally getting lost in the woods, but kind of getting lost in the woods metaphorically too, to re-stimulate curiosity. And then that's where the meaning showed up. It turns out they're kind of the same. So yes, it's a thing. But I, I would say my answer for it is, is, to, is to find your gratitude and your curiosity. And then um, your paradigm shifts, your perspective shifts, and you're not frustrated anymore because there's, that's the antidote. You know, curiosity is the antidote for frustration. Yeah. So you, your block came from a big loss. Bernardo, yeah. have you ever, I'm sorry, have you ever um, encountered painter's block? Excuse me. Sir, like writer's block where you just can't do it? Um, no, no, because there is an, an handy part of the game that you actually need to go to the studio and warm up and exercise every day. So I feel like the more you do that, the more you get ideas. Uh, I, through over so many years of working and making paintings, I have in my head more, many paintings I didn't do it. I wish I had the time to do it. I have the opposite problem, actually. That so. works into a question that I have from Facebook. Have you ever had an idea that frightened you, that you were compelled to do but didn't, were afraid to do? I wasn't afraid to do or I wasn't? Were afraid to do. 
did it, perhaps, but were initially afraid to do it. If I have an idea of a painting and the second thought is that mm, that's a dangerous move, mm -hmm. for some reason, dangerous in a, in a nice way, meaning that can be ridiculous, can be, can be silly, can be... Sometimes it's a turn on. Makes me feel like, let, let me try actually. Let me see if it's going to be such a failure. I've got a Facebook follow-up question. This is from Liz Misitano, who's an alumna from a couple of years ago. She wants to know, did you ever make a painting that was totally different from what you were used to making in your studio, either in subject matter or a new kind of style, anything like that, just where you just say, I'm going to paint unlike myself today? I, I tr and what did it look like? Well, right now I have this, this painting of a, of a seascape with these big clouds, and it looks nothing like my work. It's real smooth and rendered, because rendering is fun, and I, it's actually an act of restraint to not render. But I just was like, I'm just going to render and render and render, because I want to render with clouds. And I did, and it's weird, because people come in and they're like, who did that? That doesn't look like yours at all. That's funny. So, there's a famous story about Phyllis, Philip Guston making a perfect Bernard in his studio. And you can't imagine a, an artist less like Philip Guston, no. but apparently he made a perfect Bernard and then destroyed it. Oh. <clears throat> I've got a question from the audience here. Um, will you introduce yourself and ask your question? Sure. Um, my name is Monica. I'm a first year student here at the Academy. Um, I have a question uh, open to the artists or the faculty. Um, I guess inspired by that question about fear and idea, um, oftentimes we're delving into very tough, emotional, or personal subject matter depending on the time, you know, of our lives. And so I was wondering if, apart from maybe traditional therapy, are there any rituals that you guys do to kind of keep up your mental health while you're delving into artwork? Meditation is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, just getting to a place of, of, of not getting sucked into the thoughts. You know, I think that's really the, the, the health in it. Because you don't have to believe the thoughts that you're having. You can have all these thoughts, but you don't have to believe them and get lost in a loop. And so meditation can help you to detach from the thoughts. And then that can, that can feel a little more chill and present, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like remaining more curious about the thoughts or kind of yeah. compartmentalizing, like setting Yeah, like time. you're the one watching the thinker, you know? So it's not so serious. It's not so, you know, right in your face, not too uh, immediate. It's like it's a little bit away from you. Um, that can be really helpful. It's not easy to do, but it's helpful. Thank you. That segues right into another question. Um, but first, I just want to identify the artists again who are with us tonight. We have Manu Saluja, Alyssa Monks, Sophia Caiaphas, and Bernardo Siciliano. Um, and I've been uh, got a question from Joy from Facebook who's asking, what makes a good art teacher? Great question. And I want Peter and Margaret to answer this too. Mm -hmm. What was the question? What makes a good art teacher? Go ahead, Peter. I, one important variable is keeping your own shit out of the classroom. You know, that most people want other people to be reinforcing what they're doing. And I think it's the worst type of teacher that tries to get somebody to do the kind of work that they're doing in their own studio. Um, I'm, I'm always impressed when I go into a studio, to somebody's classroom, and I see artists finding their own voice instead of replicating the teacher's voice. I completely agree with Peter 100%. Your job as a teacher is to get inside the head of the student in front of you and understand what it is he or she is trying to do and help them find their way home. And you've got a few structures to give them. You're, you basically are teaching them composition and their job is, is to create space and put that image, whatever it is they want to put in, into that space. And those questions you can answer. Getting the questions minimalized enough for the student to answer them, but not to replicate the teacher. I always feel like there are three really important questions in critiquing somebody's work. What are you trying to do? Have you done it? Could you do it better? 
And if you really perfect. stick to that, you're actually going to get to the heart of the matter almost every time. Yeah, I would say that's perfect. Sophia, you're a recent graduate, just finished your fellowship year. What was your favorite painting class here? My favorite painting class? Well, it's got to be Bernardo's. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, I really did enjoy Bernardo's class. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it had to have been his. I keep TAing with him because of that. I, I believe that uh, having an aggressive approach is, is good. Bernardo, what makes a good art teacher? She was afraid I kicked her leg. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. What makes a good teacher of art. Uh, I agree with, uh, with, with, with Peter. The tendency of uh, transferring your style, the way you paint in the class you are teaching is a mistake. Because that's a result of several years of understanding your things. Uh, we need to teach them how the basics, in my opinion. They need to develop them way to be artists by themselves. So basically, I really like to, for instance, teach painting one because of that. And on the on that training, I really love to to focus on 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 portraits from life. I'm trying to skip as fast as possible the the section related with still lives. Um, students coming here at the academy, they don't know how to paint from life. They never did it. They were always working from, from photos, which is something I also do if I need it. But I think if you want to be, um, if you want to teach a lesson, you need to explain them how to understand, to paint, what's the meaning of, of making, making that, which is not copying a photo. It's something completely different. This is a question from face, Rosemary from Facebook for all the teachers. Bernardo, you're in this too. What have you learned from students? To be humbled. What'd you say? To be humbled. To be humbled. I would. That's a very good answer. You learn how to teach. You learn how to teach from students. You learn how to talk about the things that you care about and convey what you think is important. You find out what you think is really important to teach and how to reach them and, and find pathways and analogies and exercises that can help to convey the, the ideas you want to give them, you know? You learn so to you teach. refine your own thoughts, in effect. Yeah, and your own technique. Definitely, very well said. Hey, Peter, mm -hmm. um, Penny from Facebook wants to know, when do you know if you're ready to apply to the academy? a really interesting and difficult question. You know, <clears throat> I think you have to be almost unhappy with what you've experienced in other environments because there is it's such a challenging program. You have to be really ready to work hard. You have to be really ready to, to be humble, to learn from your colleagues and your peers and your instructors. You have to open yourself up. You have to want it really, really badly, and I almost feel like you can't. You don't get there unless you've been dissatisfied with some other experience, and there are a lot of dissatisfied people out there, um, because the challenge here really is to just experiment, and that, that's certainly one of the things that I learn from my students every year: their willingness to take risks and to abandon what they're comfortable with and to move on to things that you know challenge their wheelhouse is remarkable. Thank you, um, Manu. What's the favorite part of your painting right now for you? My favorite part? Um, well, I think that I'm, you know, there are lots of things that I wish I, I could develop further and, and get, keep going with. But, uh, but I think I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm sort of happy with some of the way that the brush strokes have gone down to describe some of the form, you know, uh -huh. some of the planes. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about you, Alyssa? What are you happiest about in your, so far? I like painting? the marks. I, I like the marks and I like the expression. I like the, the gentleness of the gaze. I was going to say that's actually one of the things that's really interesting about your portrait of Dan. It really is so much about his gentleness. There's a kind of um, tenderness that comes through the painting. Um, I also have an announcement to make just for anybody who's interested. The Academy is hosting an open house next Saturday, November 11th and you can sign up on our website for anybody that's interested.
Bernardo, what do you like best about what's going on in your work right now? Right now, I'll tell you the truth, I don't like my paintings at all right now. But that's part of the game, I guess. But you know, the beginning is a beginning, so it doesn't really matter. If I was in my studio working on this portrait, I wasn't concerned. It's part of the process. I, uh... I handed one of the questions from Facebook to our two models because they're our drawing instead of our drawing department at the school, so they've been given a mic, and would you please answer the question? I know it might be a little difficult while posing. <laughs> The question is, can you talk about the relationship between drawing and painting? Uh, for the for somebody that draws as much as I do, I'm going to give a little bit of a biased answer here. Um, but drawing is really, I think, the foundation of composition. It's the foundation of looking at shape relationships. It's the it's the foundation of so much that goes into into a painting as a kind of matrix of principles and then also as a medium in itself, if that makes, if that makes any sense. Uh, and I'll pass that over to you. Um, that was a pretty superlative answer. Um, in some ways, the question is a little bit too general. I mean, are you talking about as a student or are you talking about as a professional practice measure? Uh, because when you're a student, you're always fighting back and forth between, you know, where your drawing is and where your painting is. But for me, as a person who's a little past the student uh, phase, uh, they seem like two very distinct, unique, specialized art forms that inform each other. And they stand apart from each other more and more the more I try to understand them. And uh, they continue to inspire. I, I just think it's a, different, it's a different question depending on where you are in your development. I think one of the interesting things that these two men have just said is something that's developed at the academy. We have drawing majors here now. It used to be that drawing was, was the beginning of, a, of an idea of painting. Now we have drawings that are the finished products and some of the finest work we have here. And that takes it into an entirely different realm. A question's come in from Susanna on Facebook asking, what experiences get you most excited to paint? Emotional? physical, surrounding, sensory. What, what gets you most excited to paint, Bernardo? What is most exciting to What gets you most excited to paint? Um, what kind of experiences? When I find an image that I think is worth it, I'm so thrilled. I get like, this is strong, so I jump on it. Um, and sometimes those images are back in my storage here. Uh, and they get out of uh, out of it without any particular reasons. Years later, for instance, I made a, a painting of uh, subway steps, which I'm actually going there every day. I take the, sub those, the subway, uh, I go to the subway station every day. And I s made few sketches a long time ago. But then I put them on the side, thinking it was not an interesting image. And then suddenly, boom, a few years later, I started a very big scale painting. And, and when I started, I was so convinced, thinking, why I didn't start this thing three years ago? Yeah. Sophia, what gets you most excited to paint? I think I will just elaborate on what Bernardo said. I think the mystery the enigma in this, in like a trusting that there's something meaningful to be understood, if that makes any sense. And that takes a lot of forms. Does anybody here start from the opposite side? Bernardo was just saying he starts from an image that he's thrilled to discover he wants to paint. Does anybody start from, I want to describe an emotion or a feeling and then find an image? Melissa? No, I think of an environment first and then try to create that environment sort of in light in real life which is sometimes possible and then that's what gets me excited so you know working within that environment how about you Manu what kind of experiences get you most excited to paint I've, I've actually I have come from it from more of a, a place of um, sort of coming up with an image that might comes 
come to my mind and then and then sketch it out and then seek out the uh, whatever sort of reference I might need to complete that idea. But it sort of worked both ways for me. Um, and uh, usually it'll, sometimes it's environment, it's sort of a tie between it, uh, in living in my environment and things that I pass each day that bring ideas as well as, uh, as portraits, people's faces. I've always been drawn to that. So that'll work in there. Um, <clears throat> there's a question that's been presented. When do you know if the piece is done? Um, what is your finishing process like? Um, and that's open to all the artists. Mm. This is something that the abstract expressionists dealt with constantly. I mean, you could literally make an abstract expressionist painting for years if you wanted to. <clears throat> but for those of you who are painting and used to painting representationally, is there a point at which the painting reaches a climax that's consistent with your vision, or what? I I don't know if I have enough experience to answer that question, but I heard Desiderio say something once. I wrote it down. He said, um, a masterpiece is about to collapse under the weight under it, of its own ambition, yet it still stands. Maybe that's the moment to recognize. It's just this close from to disaster, basically. Yeah. These are also three-hour paintings. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a... When you think this, I mean, Sophia's got a different mm -hmm. work ethic, but these are basically the beginnings or the sketches of paintings. Oh, yeah, I don't yeah. think they're saying these are going to be finished, but oh, in your own studio. Oh, practice. Lord, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of, the painting stops talking to you. You know, it stops, like, asking you to do stuff and change stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're finishing a painting, there's a period of time where you look at it and go, oh, we got to do something there, and you step back, and then something else calls for you to do something, and then it just kind of goes quiet. And you're like, all right. Bye. That's it. I would agree with that. I think that at some point, you know, I, I described earlier that I, I will usually do a sketch and plan out a painting. And, I, and then, of course, there are always surprises when you go to a larger scale. So in, in stepping back and sort of seeing, you know, have I met that original intention? You know, when am I going to push it too far? But I think at the end of the day, you have to be sort of willing to, to mess it up, take risks. So, you know, but, but when I feel like I've sort of reached that point where I, I met the intention, I, I stop. Yeah. Yeah. This is a change of subject, but I, I'm curious about this. Is it harder for you uh, all here to paint somebody you know as opposed to just painting a model? I intentionally pick people I know and care about deeply and admire, really. It helps me to find that psychology, that empathy, that really motivates me to, to paint to begin with. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I insist on it. And if I don't know someone well, I, I sit down with them and talk to them and try to get to the heart of their essence. Of their story. Yeah. Do you talk to your models when they're posing for you? Sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want them to be as calm and natural and, and forget that they're modeling, you know? Mm -hmm. So you got to distract them. I put in a television set, and then right at the moment where I want the, them, their eyes to look alert, I speak to them, and you get this quick shot back. I learned it from a photographer. Oh, that's smart. Manu, do, do yeah. you find it harder or easier to paint people that you know? I would agree with, with Alyssa that it's, it's definitely um, uh, easier to work with people that, that you know really well. I, th I think because you just, you know, art as a visual language, you're trying to make paint say something about this person and when you really know who they are and their history, it, it makes it easier to tap into that. Um, not, for, not for me, it's the same. I mean, as long as I think whatever I'm painting is just a bunch of stains, not even a human being, if I start thinking this is a real person, I get tight. So I don't want to think about that. I, I, I'm sorry for I think like he's a piece of meat. So I don't care if he's somebody I know well or I don't know well. You, paint, you want to paint what you yeah. see. It's right yeah. in front of you. Sophia, do you want to weigh in on this question? Um, I mean, when I was in my undergrad, I was trying to get models, and I would grab people from the theater department because we didn't have models. And um, I learned to paint from a moving model, a model that's speaking and being animated and 
basically acting as their therapist. Um, but I think that's, it was, it was kind of shocking to come to the academy and paint people from life that actually stood still and didn't speak to me at all. I felt that there was a, a wall there. But I've learned how to appreciate that too. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Um, we're just about out of time, and I want to thank everybody that participated in the evening, particularly our four artists, our two models, our, my fellow moderators, the audience, and for all the Facebook people watching us, I'm sorry if we couldn't have gotten to every one of your questions, but thank you for watching and thank you for participating. It's been a great evening. Wait, we have two more, two more minutes or until 9 o'clock, or are we there yeah. now? I also want to just thank our artists uh, again, Bernardo Siciliano, Sofia Caiaphas, Alyssa Monks, and Manu Saluja, and our models, Michael Grimaldi and Dan Thompson, our moderators, Peter Drake and Margaret Boland. And I just uh, want to say that this is an incredible night. These paintings are gorgeous to look at. I hope it's coming through in the camera, but every single one of them is such a reflection of the person painting it. And um, it's been interesting to watch Sophia do too and see the similarities and the differences between them that you really see how it, it's coming out of someone's personality. I also just want to say that the Academy is an amazing community and that this, to me, is like a, a, a distilled essence of that community. Everybody getting together and really pouring over these particular issues. And it seemed like five minutes to me you know, even though it was two and a half hours because we care about this stuff so deeply and it's so gratifying for us just to, not only to paint, but to watch people paint and to learn from those around us. So thank you, everybody. Also wanted to thank Highline Stages, Katie Hemmer and Herod Coates, Jessa Auger, and all the student volunteers uh, this evening. It's been a fantastic team.